Good morning and welcome to the international webinar held by English Education Department of Universitas Harapan Bangsa in collaboration with Universitas Technocrat Indonesia with the theme, Innovative Approach for Remote Teaching and Learning During the Time of Disruption. First thing first, it's necessary to inform you all that before we commence this webinar, we must ensure ourselves that we will always keep this webinar running well until the end of this webinar. Secondly, I would like to remind you to check your Telegram channel in order to obtain any information related to this webinar. Well, before the event gets going, we need to inform you about the rules in this webinar. <laughs> All participants in the Zoom platform must use the real names by using the format institution underscore full name. All participants must wear neat and polite clothes and sit properly. All participants in the Zoom applications are requested to activate the video and mute the microphone during the seminar. For participants who don't comply with the rules, the committee will remind them three times. If after being reminded, the participants still don't obey, the committee will remove those participants from the Zoom room. All participants must fill in the attendance form on the link shared during the webinar by the committee during 
through the Zoom chat room and YouTube comment column. All participants must fill in the evaluation feedback form shared at the end of the webinar by the committee through the Zoom chat room and YouTube comment column. Both attendance form and feedback form will be closed at 6 p.m. Indonesian time. In the discussion session, participant questions are facilitated through the link of question shared through the chat room Zoom and YouTube comment column by typing your name, name of the presenter, and question. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May peace be upon us all. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, greetings of virtue. The Excellency, Councillor of Pendidikan Dwi Puspita Foundation, Bapak Yadi Fahru Zentrang Jaya MM. The Honorable Chairperson of Pendidikan Dwi Puspita Foundation, Bapak I. Setiawan Mangku Negara SPOM MTI. The Honorable Rector of Universitas Harapan Bangsa, Ibu Dr. Pramesti Dewi Mkes. The Honorable Vice Rector One of Universitas Harapan Bangsa, Ibu Nurse Murniati Eskep Mkep. The Honorable Vice Rector Two, Universitas Harapan Bangsa, Ibu Dr. Yuristri Naili SHMHKN. The Honorable Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, Bapak Alfizi SEMM, along with all staffs. Our distinguished speakers, Ms. Gina Mixiano Alvarado, PhD, Mr. Lee Huangdung, PhD, Mr. Akhya Rido, MA, PhD, Ms. Tri Pujiani, MPD, and Mr. Muhammad Soali, MPD and all of our distinguished guests and webinar participants. Ladies and gentlemen, whom we respect, as we all know, at the moment, we are all facing the COVID-19 pandemic, which has a profound impact on changes in all sectors of life. Therefore, we, as religious people, should extend our highest gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who always gives his grace and guidance to all of us so that we can meet on this occasion at the international webinar innovative approach for remote teaching and learning during time of disruption organized by the undergraduate of english education department of universitas Sarapan bangsa in collaboration with universitas technocrat indonesia i like to thank the speakers and invited guests who are willing to attend and would like to welcome all participants who eagerly attend this webinar. I also would like to thank all teachers and lecturers around the world for your hard effort and biggest dedication to our students. As we know that teachers are the unsung heroes. Besides, Teaching is the one profession that creates all professions. Once again, thank you to all teachers and lecturers around the world. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before starting this webinar, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Benny Crispiantoro. Here I am the moderator who will guide the webinar today. Ladies and gentlemen, I will then read the rundown of today's webinar. The first is opening. The second, singing national anthem of Vietnam, the Philippines, and Indonesia. The third, opening remark from the rector of Universitas Harapan Bangsa. The fourth, photo session. The fifth, the first panel presentation by the first and the second presenter. The next is profile video of Universitas Harapan Bangsa. After that, Q&A session. And the next, the second panel presentation by the third, fourth, and the fifth presenter. The next is interactive quiz by International Affairs 
and Marketing Office Universitas Harapan Bangsa. After that, there will be some informative videos related to Universitas Harapan Bangsa, and it will be continued with Q&A session, and the last is closing. To start the event today, for those who are non-Muslims, you can say the praying by based on your religions. For those who are Muslim, let's commence this webinar by saying Basmalah together. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The second agenda is singing the national anthem of Vietnam, the Philippines, and Indonesia. All Zoom participants are requested to activate the camera and all participants are requested to stand up in a perfect manner as long as the national anthems are being sung. Participants are requested to stand up.
the participant, please be seated. The next agenda is an opening remark as well as the official opening of this webinar from Director of Universitas Harapan Bangsa. To Ibu Dr. Pramesti Dewi Mkes, time is yours. Hi, you guys. I'm sure everyone is in good health. Thanks to the attendees who have taken the time to attend this webinar event. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace be upon us all. First, let us praise to the presence of God, the merciful God who has bestowed our pleasures for the health, the opportunities, and the happiness we feel today. Without His mercy, it is impossible for all of us to enjoy this. This webinar is held by the English Education Department of Universitas Harapan Bangsa. What an honor for Harapan Bangsa got the five great speakers from Southeast Asia countries, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Indonesia to deliver speech at this webinar session. Given that the literature on COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on education is already rich. No pandemic in the past has caused so many problems in education. The main reason we had for the first time such a last year disruptions of education around the world is the massification of education in recent years. This crisis was not only global, but arose almost simultaneously in all countries. It is was nothing that at the time of its peak set at the end of March 2020, more than 90% of the students worldwide were outside educational structures. In particular, during the restorations of the educational functions, the formal education organization seemed to lose several of the features of this type of education, such as the relative stability of the curriculum, the fixed daily schedule, the availability of all teachers. This is acquiring in practice characteristic of non-formal education, such as flexible, flexible and ad hoc solutions, differentiation in media and teaching method, changing daily schedule. In fact, the solution provided were more like non-formal education planning solutions or interventions and less similar to the traditional functions of a school or a university. UNESCO introduced the term emergency and educational disruptions for the effects of the crisis on education system and called on governments and international organizations to take actions to address the problem using the set solution, the term maintaining and disrupted learning, the continuity of learning in any way, if an outset of formal learning environments. This has obviously arisen as an option taking into account the situation worldwide and not only in developed countries, where more or less internet was the media through which maintenance was possible. Without lingering longer, I will soon start to let us begin our webinar with the theme, innovative approach for remote teaching and learning during time of disruptions. And ending this opening remark, on behalf of Universitas Sarapan Bangsa, I proudly and officially open this international webinar. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Ibu Dr. Pramesti Dewi Mkes, for the remark given and for officially opening today's webinar. Before moving along to the next session, it's better for us to take a photo session. Well, ladies and gentlemen, and all distinguished webinar participants, let's have a photo session. Okay, uh, we have two screens here. So I will take your picture one by one, screen by screen, on my account. Hold on. 
one, two, and three. Okay, second screen. On my count, one, two, and three. Okay, thank you, Mr. Benny. Thank you, Mr. Ankit. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the main event of this webinar that we have been waiting for. Presentation by our first presenter. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the first presentation about reflection on uses of blended teaching and learning, a case of Vietnam, will be delivered by Mr. Lee Huang Dung, PhD. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's invite Mr. Huang Dung to join our webinar. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, um, Professor. Good afternoon, uh, the organizing team. Good afternoon, uh, all the participants. It is my great honor to uh, join the webinar. It is my great pleasure as well. So first of all, I would like to say thank you so much, everyone, for being here uh, this afternoon for uh, this very interesting webinar yes, during the, uh, the, 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 the pandemic okay. time. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Huang. Uh, before Mr. Huang present his material, I'd like to read his CV. Mr. Huang is the Dean of English Linguistic and Literature, University of Social Sciences and Humanities, Vietnam National University. Mr. Huang obtained his Bachelor of Art in English Linguistic and Literature in 1998 and Master of Art in TESOL in 2004 from USSH. Mr. Huang received both a full scholarship grant for his PhD in education, majoring in educational leadership and management at De La Salle University, Manila from 2005 to 2008, and a fellowship on leadership development program during 2015 to 2016. Well, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Mr. Huang to deliver his presentation. Mr. Huang, you are given 30 minutes to present your presentation. To Mr. Huang, time is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, the facilitator and the moderator of the, uh, um, the webinar. Uh, so first of all, in, uh, it is, again, it is my great pleasure to share what I have uh, collected uh, during my teaching time so far, especially during the pandemic period uh, that happened all over the world. And um, uh, I will briefly, uh, is it possible if I share my slide or you can share and then for every time I have to ask you to move to the next right? Okay, so uh, in the next slide, I will just briefly uh, share with you the outline of my presentation. Um, I will give very brief introduction of the USSH and the background and the aims of my study, and uh, very short about uh, the literature review about blended learning, and uh, maybe some online, I mean, some snapshots on online or blended uh, sections uh, that I have here in Vietnam. And um, finally, I like to share some very important or major findings as well as uh, major pedagogical implication from the case study. Uh, hopefully it just give all of you uh, an idea of what's happening here in Vietnam and what people are thinking of. And probably we may, uh, maybe we can get something from it and then we can share from each other. Uh, so in the next slide, I'm going to briefly um introduce again about my university uh so uh, uh i i don't know if you can see the screen well everyone because uh, i see some pop up uh, uh from me the the host screen uh, saying that there's someone waiting waiting in the waiting room is it comfortable for everyone uh Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so can can you move? Uh, I mean, can you click on so that all the slide 
all information from the slide share. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me briefly introduce about uh, my institution. My university is University of Social Sciences and Humanity, which is a member institution of Vietnam National University, Ho Chi Minh City, uh, which is one of the two important university system in uh, Vietnam, uh, one in Hanoi and one in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, so currently our institution um, have two campuses uh, with 28 faculty with more than 27,000 of students, both in the undergrad and uh, uh, graduate levels. And uh, we have around 2,000 international students in campus uh, with uh, more than 900 uh, both teaching staff and non-teaching staff. Uh, our university is located right in the city center of Ho Chi Minh City. Okay, so uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, I will briefly introduce to you uh, the aims of my study. I did this study a few months ago, uh, but it's uh, focused on uh, a kind of um, a kind of a qualitative case study, and I. Uh, try my best to identify the key benefits and the difficulties uh, when we apply uh, blended learning in the context of Vietnam. And I, in the next few slides, I'm going to share with you some a snapshot from uh, the classes that we have during the pandemic time in Vietnam. Uh, and I also hope to propose some pedagogical implication for the blended learning uh, applicable to the context of Vietnam. Okay, so uh, in the next few slides, there are a few photos on the uh, context of uh, what I have. So um, in terms of blended learning, uh, the literature and it says, um, in a very simplest way, it is thoughtful integration of classroom face-to-face -face learning experiences with online experiences. I know that many of you know a lot about uh, planet learning and we may come up with different definition of our own. Uh, however, in this case, I just expect uh, two important definition by Garrison and Ganuka and another definition by Lim and Wong in 2016 Blended learning is the deliberate uh, fusion of the online, uh, either asynchronous or uh, synchronous. And face-to-face -face contact time between uh, teaching staff and student and or between student in a course. So the definition tend to have some certain kind of common things. But generally speaking, in the next slide, um, I would like to say that in a nutshell, why definitions may vary. The commonest one may focus on the combination of an infusion of both the traditional forms of teaching and learning with any technology enhanced devices or resources and or application for the maximum learning potential and efficiency. So in this kind of tentative concluding, I would like to highlight the idea of uh, learning potential and efficiency. Uh, so what I'm going to give you in the next few slides in terms of the uh, student, uh, I mean the snapshot show in some pictures, some um, activity of what happening in my classes uh, to give you an idea of what I did during the pandemic time. Uh, so um, yes, I have taught a number of courses during the pandemic time started uh, late uh, 2019 and uh, early uh, 2020. And even uh, later on, uh, we uh, have been asked to um, suspend for even uh, five weeks or six weeks. And uh, uh, let me share with you a little bit about the time schedule. Um, so we, uh, I personally have uh, two classes for the regular program at the BA level and uh, two classes for the MA in TESOL, uh, teaching English to speak of other uh, languages. Um, and uh, one more MA class uh, for the joint program using the D2L. 
for the regular program, we use Google Meet or we use Microsoft Teams or we use Zoom uh, together with the uh, current LMS that we have. Together with that, uh, some of the teachers are requested, are uh, allowed to uh, use different kind of um, synchronous uh, or asynchronous online session. So we combine both the face-to-face -face and the online session. Uh, so you know that uh, like uh, before the new year, before January in, 2000, in 2020, we already started our face-to-face uh, -face session. And after the new year holiday and then during February, we have about five weeks off. And during those five weeks off, uh, we cannot go to classes anymore. And the university requires us to uh, organize online courses uh, in um, early March. So uh, we have around six or seven or even eight sessions teaching online and after several of our teachers finish the online component they get back to the school so it means uh, we have the face-to-face -face and the online session and then uh, another face-to-face uh, -face session to wrap the course up uh, so um, this is the context of our of my study uh, okay so in the next few slides can you show the next one please uh, here are the few activity uh, about the lovely memories that I have with the student, both for the face-to-face -face and for the online section like this. Uh, you know, some classes uh, have about 45 students, you know, uh, so it would be difficult for me to manage everything. However, I do believe that I did overcome the difficulty and come up with the, some uh, very good way to uh, solve the problem out. Okay, so can you show the next one, please? Uh, yes. Also, uh, I also asked them to have a very good presentation. Uh, they can prepare presentation online, like what we are doing now in the webinar. Uh, for this call, I am teaching uh, language uh, testing and assessment, language assessment. Um, so I asked the group to present. And you can see on the screen, here are the questions that I asked them to prepare in the Google Doc. So concurrently, we open a different kind of, um, uh, of, 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 of session so that they can uh, really uh, contact and interact with each other in different way. Can you move to the next one, please? Uh, Yes, this is also a kind of uh, important issue that I will go back to uh, show you some kind of reflection on what I did to the student. You know, one of the different county that I uh, did write in my paper, although I cannot present everything here because within the limited time, I cannot present everything. So uh, the difficult thing here is how can we really maximize the student learning? So that is one of our teacher concern. So, you know, before organizing different kind of online courses for our teacher at a faculty, I uh, you to uh, organize at least three uh, coaching for the home staff. Uh, so for some certain kind of coaching, we have uh, maybe uh, 70 to 80 teacher attending online. So that I am the one, I was the one who coached them how to do or what to prepare. So one of the big concern is the how we have the student uh, interact well enough during the online session. So we try our best to make the online session really real like what we are doing now. Okay, so these are the very heartbreaking and even stressful in the Q&A session as well. Okay, I, I put them in the quotation mark because you can see in my student reflection, my participant reflection that they really love it. Can you move to the next one, please? Uh, with the online presentation, um, yeah, here's also another example of online presentation. Can you move uh, to the next one? Uh, yes. And um, after the period, we go back and have face-to-face -face, uh, session with different kind of topic. Can you move to the next one? Okay, and uh, we have different kind of debate and discussion. Uh, can you move to the next one? Yes. 
uh, okay. And the student work in group and discuss um, some very hard or interesting topic. Okay, uh, and the next one, please. Uh, okay, so here are the student have to confront again, those questions related to the previous session or the current session, and they have to debate, they have to answer different kinds of question and so on and so forth. Okay, and the next one. Uh, yeah, um, this is a very challenging uh, issue. Uh, so as far as I uh, already share, um, I did ask the student to present online, uh, to prepare the Q&A session online and to give comments online. Uh, so I also handle another course named uh, TSON Program Administration. Uh, I did ask them to uh, show online the question asked by the participant and uh, at the same time they prepare to answer and to pay for their uh, question and they also prepare the online comment as well so all of the things i try my best to facilitate and to give the student uh, some certain time to be very active so the student cannot be very passive while attending uh, the online synchronous sessions okay can you move to the next please Okay, so thank you. Uh, so again, this is a kind of qualitative case study, which is by nature exploratory. And um, I uh, trying to collect the information from the wide teaching observation. And uh, I also use Zoom or Google Meet or uh, Microsoft Teams for every uh, session I do record like what we are recording here. And um, I uh, analyze the recording as, as well as I collect the final reflection by uh, some selected student. I, although I have all the student uh, individually reflected by the end of the course, uh, but I select and then I choose 19 one in a small group. Uh, and especially those are the teacher for the other, they might not be the teacher. So I just look at the teacher who are also my student in the MA classes who have been, uh, who have at least three to 10 years of teaching English at different foreign language center and university uh, at the same time. So they may reflect on uh, what they experience from my class and what they do uh, during their classes as well. And I also interview five representatives from them. So by nature, my case study is just a kind of exploratory one. Uh, however, it does give some kind of information uh, noticeable for us to think of. Uh, okay, in the next slide, um, here are some major findings that I uh, try to uh, give a very snapshot of what we have. Um, so I found out that the, um, all the participants uh, confirm the significant contribution of blended learning, uh, making it a kind of reasonable combination between the face-to-face -face and online session, uh, which is really uh, tremendous. And uh, the teacher, you know, in Vietnam, uh, because um, long time before we uh, experienced the pandemic period, uh, in our institution, we just use uh, online teaching as a kind of option, uh, an optional, it depends on the uh, teacher choice. Uh, but after this period, they believe that uh, it would be much better if we combine both the online session and the face-to-face -face session. And you know, during the council, the university council meeting uh, in the recent uh, month, uh, our university also changed our plan and uh, put forward uh, some other project thinking and putting into practice the using of blended learning. And you know, uh, many of our faculty at our university are expected to revise the curriculum, including the uh, online component in all, in the majority of the, uh, the online courses. So, I mean, uh, into our syllabus, into our syllabi. So that's the very big change. And another thing, um, they also confirm the usefulness and the convenience of combining the face-to-face -face and the online session, especially when we 
give the student more time in completing the assignment in um, online chatting while you are away from the school where while you are off out of the campus or the like or discussing with classmates or with professors uh, but of course it doesn't mean that many people always uh, like what we are doing however the majority of uh, the 19 professional and the majority uh, as far as i remember 90 percent of uh, let's say uh, 90 uh, students of the three classes uh, really um, agree that um, the blended learning is useful and convenient to them okay so this is just some key uh, findings in the next slide i like to uh, share with you some uh, very important thing that my uh, students who are also teacher uh, reflect on their own transformation uh, so i name it as a kind of self-transformation process uh, they believe that uh, after learning uh, with what I have carried out, what I have conducted in my courses uh, during the blended uh, and between face-to-face -face and online session, they become more responsible for their learning in terms of reviewing what they have learned, in terms of identifying both their own strengths and weaknesses, and therefore they may improve their knowledge retention. And the second one is they become more reflective on what and how to improve their logical arguments and to update their writing assignment with more input in order to continuously adapt themselves to the requirement of the course. You know, this is the very important reflection that I found from many of the interviewee and the reflection of all 19 uh, ELT professional because they uh, tend to uh, look at the um, personal development, why they are learning um, in both ways. And uh, you know that, especially through the Q&A session, because I usually choose randomly who would answer the question and who would answer the question. So they tend to be really stressful to some extent, but after a while, they tend to be very familiar with what we are doing. And that's the reason why I say that a kind of heartbreaking uh, moment in the course. But of course, they, you know, by the end of the course, they draw some kind of heart, share in their reflection, uh, different kind of thing. So that's really nice. And they tend to be very, very proactive to their own shortcomings for critical self-improvement. And this is a serious learning process. Okay. So uh, these are the major findings. So in the next two slides, I will show you uh, some extract from the respondent interview. Uh, can you just show them all? Uh, the self-transformation, uh, like some of them would share, I truly appreciate what the professor has offered in terms of knowledge and inspiration. I often wonder that if it just suit me because I feel I'm not as good as other people. However, after this, I feel much confident about myself and I want to try my best to become a greater teacher. I wish I could be as great as my professor to motivate the student to be the best person of themselves. So during the process of learning, I allow the student a lot of time reflecting on their own practice, their own question, and even I sometimes throw the question back to them so that they can really think, really reflect on what they are doing, what they should do. Okay, so I'm not going to read in details, but here is just a kind of um, self uh, some example to show the self-transformation process. Can you move to the next slide, please? Okay, can you move to the next? Okay, thank you. Uh, so more or less the same way. The core was challenging yet productive as I learned a lot through practical practices. So these are some reflection by the participant. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, so to wrap up, I just highlight some, uh, can you, yeah, can you click all so that all the uh, idea would uh, come out? Uh, altogether, I have six important points in terms of pedagogical implication. Uh, one more, one more, please. Can you click? Can you click the next one? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so I have six 
uh, main point here in terms of teaching and learning, um, we are suggested to balance the structure of the face-to-face -face session and the online session. Uh, it doesn't mean that too many online sessions is good or too many face-to-face -face sessions is good. Although I know that uh, this would be difficult during the pandemic time if we uh, transfer to the total online session. Uh, however, that would be a very special case. But in the long run, for the long term, probably we try our best to make the online session to be real, as real as we can. And the second point, we try our best to, we should try our best to plan the teaching and the learning activity for a well-communicated and constructive alignment of the course. Um, the important word here is constructive alignment because in my paper, I put um, serious emphasis on constructive alignment, which show the relationship among the course learning outcome, the teaching and the learning activity, and the assessment task. So, you know, I try my best, even during the online activity for the online session, I do grade them. So, whatever they do, they are graded. And uh, usually that would better motivate the student again. But of course, sometimes we may have the feeling that we create some kind of stress to the student. But of course, it's already shown in the course syllabus. So uh, I believe that is a kind of contract, is a kind of agreement um, between the teacher and the student. And therefore, they will learn uh, even more. So we should also try our best to engage the learner and enhance their autonomy by different way. Uh, my way is just uh, one example, and I do believe that a good number of participants here today and other speakers may also share with us a lot of things uh, that they, they can suggest. And uh, for the constructive alignment, we are expected to align the assessment task for effective learning, as well as we try to cultivate a transformative uh, reflection on the student, helping the student to seriously reflect on what they have learned during the face-to-face -face and the online session, and uh, which help them to become a kind of lifelong learner, making it better prepare for their future. And even if you are training the teacher, that would be better for them to train their student to become even uh, longer lifelong learner <laughs> in another way. So uh, another, uh, I mean, the last pedagogical implication, uh, we should provide sufficient technical and pedagogical training for both teachers and learner when we apply the blended learning. Uh, I do experience some difficulty when my teacher uh, coming to me, uh, uh, making a phone call or sharing with me via email, uh, sharing their difficulty, why, we, why they are teaching using blended. A solution or blended learning. So I do believe that as the dean or vice dean or academic manager in general, we have to think of uh, providing or helping them with pedagogical pedagogical training uh, when applied in the online learning or the blended learning. So uh, that's everything that I can share during the very short time here. So thank you so much, everyone, for paying serious attention. Thank you. Can you show the next slide, please? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, okay. thank you, Mr. Wang, for delivering such an interesting and fruitful material. The next presentation will be delivered by Ms. Gina Misiano Alvarado, PhD, who will talk about a very interesting topic about teaching and learning in the new normal. Welcome, Ms. Gina. How are you today? Thank you. I'm fine. All right. It's nice to meet you, Ms. Gina. Same here. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before Ms. Gina delivers her presentations, I will read her bio data first. Her full name is Ms. Gina Misiano Alfarado, PhD. She is from Arellano University, the Philippines. Her career objective 
is to be a passionate educator and speaker with an enthusiasm for new experience, responsibilities, and challenges to make a difference. Her educational background is she has attained a certification course of TESOL at Clark School, Quezon City on October 2012. She has conducted many research. One of them is about awareness of millennial undergraduate student of a private university in the Philippines on biotechnical practices and issues, Arellano University in 2018. Ms. Gina has also joined many professional seminars and training. One of them is the second Asian Conference on Educational Development in Brunei Darussalam in 2019. Well, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, here is our second presenter of the day, Ms. Gina. Ms. Gina, the time is 30 minutes for you to deliver your presentation. So, Ms. Gina, time is yours. Okay, thank you. First and foremost, good afternoon to everyone. I'd like to thank Mr. Barlian Crisanto and the Harapan Bang Bangsa University for inviting me as one of the speakers in today's international webinar on innovative approach for remote teaching and learning during the time of disruption. So my topic will focus on teaching learning in the new normal. Next slide, please. Okay, let me just share a quotation that I found relevant for this time of disruption. The art of teaching is the art of assisting discovery. So teachers should not spoon feed, but rather guide students to discover new knowledge and skills through their own experiences. Okay, next slide, please. Another quotation, all students can learn and succeed, but not in the same way and not on the same day. Exactly. Especially in, next slide, please. The new normal. Okay, we have to consider the environment, the home environment of our learners who have to study at home. The new normal, according to the collegiate, means student populations are shifting, enrollments are declining, funding models are changing, and there is growing demand for accountability and increased emphasis on creating efficiencies and drivers for technology decisions are changing. So the COVID-19 crisis presents an opportunity for the education sector to come together, forge connections and share what works. Next slide, please. So what will our schools look like beyond COVID-19? Well, in the Philippines, the COVID-19 crisis has affected about 27 million learners, 1 million teachers and non-teaching staff, as well as the families of learners. Because of this disruption, Schools are forced to adopt online learning and readjust their budget allocation in order to respond to this emerging need of training teachers. So definitely online teaching involves a lot of preparation and teachers now find themselves having to use tools they were not familiar with before. Okay, next slide, please. Here are some news articles regarding the Philippine education and the new normal. According to Jorge of Philippine Daily Inquirer, education's new normal will not just be about operating in an environment that secures the health of students, nor will it be about completely transitioning to online modalities. Instead, it should be about using technology to increase efficiency in areas with the capacity to do so while empowering learners and communities to create positive learning environments in which the student can grow. It should not sacrifice quality, but continue to provide qual equal opportunities 
most especially to the marginalized and vulnerable sectors. According to a Commission on Higher Education, they recently urged the higher education institutions to use flexible learning systems using digital and non-digital technology as the academic year opens in August. So all levels of education in the Philippines from the primary, secondary, and tertiary will be starting the online or flexible distance learning this coming August for school year 2020-2021. Next slide, please. So this is how education in the Philippines in the new normal will look like, and I guess everywhere else in the world. So it will be distance learning or remote learning, focusing on social learning. It will be accessibility to technology will be the main focus because this is crucial. Without internet access, how can our students learn from home? And of course, you have interactive telecommunications, sharing of data, voice and video as learning experiences. And then we have online classes and synchronous and asynchronous delivery. What used to be simply teacher and students in a classroom setting has now become an expanded connection of people beyond borders, time, and space. Why? Because there is separation of teacher and learner. And while the learners are at home, they have other people around them that may assist in their learning, such as their parents, guardians, or siblings. And there will be two types of learning, the self-directed or individual and the collaborative. And of course, the institutionally based learning management system will also play a major role. Next slide, please. The biggest challenge for schools transitioning to online learning is the widening inequality of access to and usage of information and communications technology. Why? Because online resources used for teaching and learning need accessibility to the internet. Okay. Apparently, advancements in information technology and the internet are widening the divide between the educational haves and have-nots, with many households in the Philippines that can barely afford a stable internet connection. Even those with access to the internet experience infrastructural gaps in term intermittent connection including discrepancy in internet speeds to bridge this digital divide efforts must be devoted to developing distance and offline multimedia teaching modes and learning systems that can allow users to study courses using their personal computers as well as allow faculty to track and record their learning next slide please Next slide, please. Okay. Because of the internet connectivity problems, we have decided to use synchronous and asynchronous learning. Synchronous when teachers uh, have face-to-face -face or live chat with our students, check on their attendance, give them instructions, and possibly be more engaging and effective in teaching. Asynchronous is when students learn at different times, when they don't have access to the internet. So communication is not live. Usually in this aspect, we have email, we communicate through emails, they work on their modules, and then we also leave instructions. We have uh, pre-recorded videos, and this allows students to work at their own pace. Next slide, please. Okay, so... I'm sure all schools are using the learning management system. It is what every administrator wants it to be. It stores and organizes data using servers and networks. It creates a digital learning experience, aiding teachers in the teaching and students in learning. And it deploys and tracks online learning initiatives. Next slide, please. In our university, the stored data could be the syllabi or course outlines, lesson plans, modules, attendance records, curricula, grade sheets, quizzes or formative tests, and periodic exams or summative tests. Next slide, please. 
online teaching is definitely challenging. So these are some of the unique challenges that uh, I come across and I like to share them with you and some instructional strategies to address each. Okay. Please. Okay. Challenge number one is passive students. So unless thoughtfully crafted, online instruction can turn students into passive, passive observers rather than active participants. So they might pass assessments and complete learning activities, but they are not planning on using their new knowledge to make connections with previous material or real world examples. So how do we address this? Please click. Instructional strategy would be in online learning environments, it's important to help students engage with course material in a way that makes sense for them. So with inline interactive questions, it is easy to track completion and comprehension of course content. These questions can be used to introduce new concepts, reinforce students' understanding of topics, and assess learning. Some of the examples were presented in, by the previous uh, speaker. So instructors can also easily export grades and participation data to their learning management system. Next, please. Another challenge is, please, staying connected with students. In an online classroom, much of the learning is completed asynchronously, and students often feel disconnected from their instructor as well as their peers. So it can be difficult for instructors to teach online when they struggle to gauge how students are comprehending course content and whether they are participating in learning experiences. So how can this be addressed? Instructional strategy, feedback loops are key to building strong connections with learners in an online environment. When students complete a task, they get feedback and make adjustments accordingly. So feedback is meant to be non-evaluative and focused on a specific course learning objective. Since this is an ongoing process, Regular online formative assessments can build a continuous feedback loop. Okay, next slide. A third challenge is encouraging collaboration. Interaction among students is one of the single most important elements of successful online education. So collaborative engagement motivates learning and promotes a deeper and more critically aware approach to the subject matter. Strategy? To encourage collaborative problem solving, consider giving students a more specific task than simply commenting on each other's ideas. Ask directly for constructive feedback about their classmates' submissions, for example, Focus on one claim in a colleague's response that you think deserves to be developed in more depth. Suggest how that claim could be further developed and supported with evidence. Students are then invited to analyze, synthesize, and then critique the information presented. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. The shift to online learning can be difficult. It can require restructuring course components using new pedagogical approaches, learning activities, and tech tools that may be new to you and your students. Okay, consider Bloom's taxonomy of cognitive development. Please click. Okay, online teaching should allow students to employ skills that go beyond knowledge and comprehension by developing and using higher order thinking skills or HOTS of application, analysis, and thesis. synthesis. Remember, 20 minutes of listening to a lecture is the maximum amount of time that students can process information effectively. So minimize lectures and maximize your activities. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. For your activities, you have to consider these two categories of active learning online. For individual learning, the learner applies course content 
that is read either online or through course materials through writing, making diagrams, or concept mapping. Example, for the course World History 2. Next, your activity would be interactive timeline of revolution history. Your instructional vehicle would be an online discussion forum. And the goal is to describe the historical significance of one revolution that occurred between 1770 and 1970 in terms of its political influence on subsequent events. Next, please. For co cooperative learning or collaborative learning, it is a structured form of group work where students pursue common goals while being assessed individually, respond and engage with fellow classmates. Example, the course is Foundations of Science. Your activity would be group position statement on a controversial issue. The instructional vehicle would be an online discussion forum for each group. And the goal is an asynchronous, asynchronous activity, not in real time, wherein students can participate at times convenient for them through groups, discussion board, and through the messaging system within. Next slide. Okay, now for English. Actually, the previous two examples are also applicable for English subjects. Now for online teaching, uh, you can access the eslspeaking.org, or that's uh, English for second language um, activities. Uh, one of those is the picture prompt ESL warm up, which I chose because it's very simple and practical to use. And it goes through levels. So you start simple and gets more complicated. Anyway, so depending on the level, they can say words of things they see make predictions about what will happen next, relate what they see to their own experiences, make sentences based on the picture, and answer some simple questions just by the use of pictures. Okay, next slide. Okay, here's one activity wherein you can assess reading comprehension by picture and sentence matching. So here are three photographs on the screen. So your students will be asked to match, uh, to find which of these pictures matches with the sentence that I will give. So here's the sentence. Experiencing the daily tasks of medical frontliners can be stressful. So which of the three pictures matches the statement? Okay, it's next, the middle picture. Okay, uh, using the same set of pictures, you can also have another set of activity for grammar purposes. Okay, please click. Picture prompt to focus on English prepositions, wait. So you will ask your students to describe each photograph or each picture using a proposition, preposition. So the first one on the left side, a thermal scanner is placed near the forehead to take one's temperature. So the preposition near is there. For the center picture, a group hug among colleagues can help relieve stress. So the preposition among is used. For the third picture on the right, Every medical staff must always wear personal protective equipment or PPE at work. So the preposition at is there. See, so you can do uh, multiple things with just one, one activity. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, let's start simple again using picture prompt. Okay, what color are your eyes? So you ask your students, so they look at this. This is very stimulating. When, when you use very colorful and vivid pictures, your students will be stimulated. So the answer, my eyes are, hmm, is it green, blue, or brown? This is for level one and two. As you go higher, next slide, please. Your task will be describe your eye color more imaginatively. Then you can give them three minutes. The learning outcome would be to create imaginative descriptive language. 
So for level two to three, write a sentence about your eye color using one or two adjectives and a comma. Can you add a simile? Possible answer would be, my eyes are a beautiful shiny color. They are blue like the sea. For level four and five, write a more adventurous description of your eye color using adjectives, an adverb, a word to describe a verb, a comma, and a simile. Possible answer, sparkling intensely, my rich coffee-colored eyes held your gaze like a magnificent eagle stalking its prey. So what do you think is the color of her eyes? It's brown because of the clue coffee-colored. Okay, for the highest level, write an engaging inventive description of your eye color using a comma, possibly a semicolon, and vocabulary. Possible answer, a forest pool under the shade of ancient oaks. My eyes offer the beholder a deep and lustrous, gleaming, shiny, shimmering, darkness to escape into. So everything is there. And what do you think is the color of her eyes? It's green because of the clue forest pool. So this is an interactive and very stimulating activity that you can use to teach English. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, there are other online teaching tools and resources that you can access through the link at the bottom. Okay, teaching tools, tools that can be used for creating and editing technology enhanced tasks, activities, and materials for language learning, media source, such as audio, video, and images that can be used for language teaching and learning, and additional tools, sources, and resources that language teachers can explore and experiment with. Okay, next slide. So these are some of the examples of teaching tools, media sources, additional tools, sources, and resources. I will not expound on them because you can just access the link that I mentioned earlier. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so when you teach online, be sure to take note of the following tips to make your teaching uh, effective. So first step is keep it simple. That's exactly what it should be because you have to consider our learners are not all above average. Okay, next. Think of your students. Think that they have, if do they have access to these resources? So you have to be very creative and you have to consider their environment. Next. Break lessons into manageable chunks. Don't overwhelm your students. Okay, next. Record your own video. Actually, that's what we are doing now. And then we upload it in our learning management system or LMS so that our students can access it uh, asynchronously. And the last one is reuse content. So there's no need if they are available, no need to improvise. Uh, just make use of whatever resources you have, as long as it is still uh, effective for your lesson. You don't need to reinvent the wheel unless necessary. So next slide, please. Now that everyone is teaching using online tools and content to students at a distance, it'll allow them to explore and experience the potential of this form of learning. So unlike the first speaker, they've already experienced online teaching. We, in, uh, most of us here in the Philippines, are still going to implement online flexible learning next month when school year 2020-2021 opens. So I learned a lot from the first speaker and hopefully we will also apply what he has shared from his study. Next slide, please. So thank you once again and a pleasant afternoon.
Well, thank you very much, Miss Gina. What an interesting and useful presentation. Miss Gina, actually, you still have five minutes left and you can finish uh, in time before the time is up. Well, thank you once again, Miss Gina. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have already seen two interesting presentations from the first two great speakers. I'd like to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to ask any questions, please type your question on the link of question shared through the chat room Zoom and YouTube comment column by typing your name, name of the presenter, and your question. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to have a break. We'll be watching profile video of Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Ladies and gentlemen, happy watching the video. Growing and developing together to build a country has become a great ideal that is firmly encrusted in the minds of all the nation's rising generations. Purwokerto, our beloved city, has been an inseparable part of the long history of the founding of prosperous land on the equator. The beauty of nature and the noble of our human culture become the exotic attraction for anyone who wants to know it. It has been a long journey for us to accompany the nation's rising generations to learn, build their characteristics, and foster their confidence. We will never be tired to keep struggling and transform to realize the noble ideals of the sovereignty of our beloved country, Indonesia. Selamat datang di Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Tempat kami belajar. Mengasah kemampuan. Jadi ahli di bidang yang kami tekuni. Harapan Bangsa University is a transformation of Harapan Bangsa Institute of Health Sciences, which was established in 2002 under the offices of Bui Puspita Foundation by Mr. Haji Ziaruddin Amin. We are committed to carrying out the mission of implementing quality higher education and having spirit of entrepreneurship in order to create human resources who are independent, professional, and culture conduct research and serve the community. Harapan Bangsa University has established international cooperation with colleagues in various countries such as in Australia, the Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, India, and South Korea. Currently, Harapan Bangsa University has three faculties with 13 study programs. Education program at Harapan Bangsa University has been designed to enable the students to understand the disciplines which are taught and to have a PKP practice skills supported with the use of digital technology in every study program. Harapan Bangsa University provides qualified and sophisticated facilities to support the students' learning comfort, such as library, Sciences Laboratory, Social Sciences Laboratory, Technology Fast Classroom with Video and Audio Recorder. Lecturers from various countries and Indonesian prestigious universities and 
the opportunity to get scholarship, join studies, exchange, and join internship program in many countries in the world. Harapan Bangsa University will support the development of students' interests and talents through various units of students' activities such as sports and arts. Suasana kampus di sini dari dulu aku semester 1 sampai 4 selalu kondisi ya selalu asik Kuliah sangat nyaman banget karena dosennya yang asik, metode pembelajar menarik Buat mahasiswa tingkat akhir kayak aku pastinya rajin banget yang namanya ke perpustakaan Tapi aku betah lama-lama di sana berjam-jam sekalipun Karena aku ngerasain nyamannya fasilitas di perpustakaan itu Wah itu nggak berhasil di perpus ya Dan fasilitas yang sangat oke okay banget Kami dari Yayasan akan berupaya semaksimal mungkin memberikan dukungan secara penuh kepada Universitas Kembangsa dalam penyediaan sarana, prasarana, sumber daya manusia, baik staf maupun dosen, agar Universitas Harapan Bangsa dapat mewujudkan visi misinya dengan baik. Universitas Harapan Bangsa siap mewujudkan cita-cita besar untuk menjadi Center of Excellence Perguruan Tinggi dalam pengembangan IPTEX dan sumber daya manusia yang mandiri dan berbudaya. Kami terus berupaya mengantarkan anak bangsa untuk menjadi lulusan yang profesional dan memiliki semangat kewirausahaan serta mampu bersaing secara global. Harapan Bangsa University is ready to create graduates who are excellent and characterized, supported with English skills and entrepreneurship, so that they will be ready to be assigned in many strategic positions, both in their work field and entrepreneurship. At Harapan Bangsa University, we create the bright future of the nation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, and all distinguished webinar participants, here comes the first Q&A sessions. In this first Q&A session, we'd like to open an invite for questions. And these questions will be addressed to Ms. Gina, and Mr. Huang. Miss Gina, are you still with us? Hi, Miss Gina, are you still with us? Miss Gina, can you unmute your Zoom? Yeah, I'm here. All right, thank you. <laughs> Okay. Well, so we have come to the Q and sessions. Okay. We've already got some questions from the participants. Sure. Right. So the first questions from Maidina Astuti Handayani, mm -hmm. addressed to Miss Gina. Yeah. He asked about what major pedagogy dealing with. Video technology providing educators to have build the ability to review lessons and giving students independence in research and catching up on this and that. It has been a primary resource during this disruption and the transition to the new normal in education. So based on your explanation before, what major pedagogic do we have to use dealing with this uh, online learning? Actually, it depends on the teacher and the learners. So you adjust your pedagogy and <clears throat> according to the needs of your learners. Uh, I believe that constructivist uh, pedagogy would be most effective for me because uh, you assist the discovery of the learners in order that they may um, learn from their experiences and acquire new, new skills and knowledge. So it's more on the constructivist. So it's more on the constructivist. Yes, Ms. Yeah. Gina. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Gina. The next question goes to Ms. Gina. So the questions 
is about uh, minimizing lectures, not yes. more than 20 minutes, and mm -hmm. minimizing activities in the classroom. So yes. based on your experience, how did the students uh, engage with the activities, either outside or inside the classroom? Um, as I've mentioned, we have not started with our online uh, uh, modality yet. It will be starting August. But uh, as, as, as what has been presented in research studies, um, students can only listen to a lecture for a maximum of 20 minutes or definitely they will get bored. So what more for online and uh, uh, online learning? So you have to make your lessons very interactive as much as possible. And in fact, we are being encouraged to have a lecture of less than 20 minutes and then um, inject it with other activities that they can do instead of just listening to you online. Yes, you're right, Ms. Gina. Instead of making the students listening to our explanation online, yes. uh -huh. we have to create more and more interesting activities in the class. Exactly. Right. Right. Well, uh, another question. Uh, Ms. Gina, uh, good afternoon. This question is from Jeffrey Daud a student from Universitas Technocrat Indonesia. Mm -hmm. According to your presentation, some of the respondents feel satisfied with the result of the online presentation. Okay. They feel excited about the courses and so on. But on the other side, there are some students who cannot access the course. For example, they are in rural areas and hard to get a good internet connection. Mm -hmm. According to your presentation about the synchronous and asynchronous method, yeah. do you think that it is working to the students to comprehend the lesson given? And what's your strategy to make sure that the students understand about the courses the teacher or the lecturer has given? Thank you. Okay, yeah. okay thank you for that question. Uh, at our end, we have pre-recorded videos wherein we explain the lesson thoroughly and give them instructions on what to do. And on top of that, we also have modules that they can access asynchronously when they have access to the internet. So we provide them with these things because we know that they cannot have access to internet anytime. That's why we adopted both synchronous and asynchronous. So for those students who cannot um, be with us on real time, they, they are free to access the modules and the pre-recorded videos and the PowerPoint presentations that we have uploaded in our LMS. That's it. All right, thank you, Ms. Yuna. What a great explanation. Thank, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, the next question addressed to Mr. Huang. Mr. Huang. Are you still with us? Hi, Mr. Huang. Yeah, hello. I am still with you, but can you hear me clearly? Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can. Uh, okay, yeah, because actually I am at a meeting, the University Council meeting. So um, I'm sorry, it might be a bit noisy, but can you just share the questions and I will try my best to share my thinking. All right. Thank you, Mr. Huang. Yes. Uh, the, the question is about how does teacher take their role in blended learning and how does blended learning elevate the students' competencies? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the questions. Um, in, in, my, uh, in my classes, in my classes, um, actually I have uh, trying to uh, encourage my student um, to put everything that they uh, want to do in the syllabus, in the course syllabus. As I emphasize in my presentation, uh, it all depends on how you really plan the teaching and the learning activity, right? 
So, uh, can you wait for a while? I will go out of the room for uh, maybe for less noise. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, hello. Um, can you hear me clearly? Can you hear me clearly, is everyone? Oh, okay, yeah. So I I I went out I go out of the room for a while. It's um, clear. Is it okay? Is it okay? Can Can you hear me? Can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, yes. So um, actually, as I mentioned earlier, I I think that uh, we probably need to uh, coach our teachers. And of course, we need to coach our student very well. As I mentioned earlier, we should uh, give the student a uh, grade for all of in-class and out-of-the-class uh, activity. So whatever they are doing, then we try our best to uh, show them that uh, what is the percentage of their contribution and what would we expect them to do. So in terms of the learning outcome, I would expect them to uh, show very clearly uh, how they can achieve the kind of learning outcome and what kind of strategy they will uh, do or they will need to uh, uh, obtain that kind of learning outcome. So, so I, I, uh, whatever I want to do, then I put in a kind of uh, syllabus or syllabi. And I did uh, guide my teacher uh, during the, uh, the disruption period at, um, you guys, you have to uh, be very clear in the way we plan the teaching and the learning activity for all of the students. Uh, so in other words, I can say that uh, to be a teacher, uh, the teacher should be a very good or even a great designer for learning. The designer of learning and the designer for learning. Uh, so uh, this is very important. Well, that's an interesting explanation, Mr. Huang. Uh, uh, yeah. Mr. Huang, uh, I have a question dealing with blended learning. Uh, could we combine blended learning with project-based learning in the classroom? Have you uh, ever done it before? Could you please share your experiences? Thank you. Yeah, sure, I did. Uh, thank you so much. Very interesting question. I love the question. Uh, so. Uh, you know, I did combine project-based. However, it would take the teacher time. Uh, if the teacher assign a kind of project to the student, then uh, again, we have to be very clear in the uh, that kind of project. Uh, but let's say if the project does not require the student to get out of their home uh, for uh, for collecting the data or for doing some certain thing during the uh, social distancing period, and then that would be fine. Uh, so, uh, for example, I asked the student to do some kind of group project research, or I asked the student to do some observation. Uh, but you know, um, they have to write some portfolio and they uh, have to attend at least three uh, classes by the other teacher for some certain course. Uh, so, you know, one of the interesting thing here is during the pandemic time and the students have to ask their college or to look for some certain um, teacher from certain foreign language center to uh, attend the classes online as well. And then they write in their portfolio. So, you know, in terms of project based, we can carry it out. However, whatever we, uh, we ask the student to do, then we put down into a kind of description, detailed description and detailed procedure of what they should do, how they are going to do, and what they say and what they So usually, instead of speaking like this, I put words into a kind of a form. I put words into a kind of guideline, like the procedure for them to follow, step-by-step -step procedure. Uh, so as far as I follow the student, of course, it's time-consuming for the teacher as well. Um, so the student enjoy it. Uh, it's kind of new experience to them as well. Uh, but if we can, then we can. So I, I do believe that we, we can still organize or give the students some kind of assignment for, uh, uh, for them to do. Yeah. All right, very clear explanation. Thank you. Well, uh, the next question goes to both speakers. Uh, okay, Asking about 
how to measure the effectiveness of online learning, whether it's really effective and how to measure the effectiveness of online or blended learning. Mm -hmm. uh, who will answer first, Mr. Huang or Ms. Gina? Uh, either, either with the who would like you to invite, okay. who would like to invite, how about Professor Gina? Would you yeah. like to say first? Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Uh, since we will be using our LMS or learning management system, uh, it would be easy to measure uh, as we will be able to export the grades and participation data to the learning man management system. And from there, uh, our students can also access their performance and we can communicate with each other if they need help, uh, they need assistance in their uh, uh, achievement. So that's how we will be able to do, to measure their um, performance and assess their learning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can can I add something? Can I add something? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so sure. I would like to add. Um, for my classes, I do use the D2L um, design to learn, design to learn, which is also an LMS. Uh, so in which we also assign the student uh, some kind of activity with some certain deadline for submission, deadline for the discussion, and uh, their uh, paper would be graded online as well. Uh, so first of all, I can say again, we can base on the LMS. Second, because when we teach online or when we use a blended solution to uh, carry out our classes, um, we tend to apply kind of formative assessment in our uh, course syllabus. Therefore, the online component would uh, account for a certain amount of perce percentage of the score and some other work uh, would account for some uh, other component. So in uh, generally speaking, we have to think of how to particular rise, how to uh, particulate the, uh, the score into several kind of component. Uh, so whatever the student achieve, it is a kind of collective um, of a score and accomplishment. So in short, formative assessment would really help. Uh, we help us ensure the student learning. And the third point here is the uh, progress checking. Uh, of course, when we design the activity online, we usually give them the student, the student the, the deadline and uh, what to do and the description of the task. And we ask them to submit the product and so on and so forth. So our monitoring of the student process uh, or progress is really important. So I believe that uh, with that kind of thing, the teacher can really measure the effectiveness and the efficiencies of what we are doing. Yeah. May I add something? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with the professor and uh, that regular online uh, formative assessments can also build a continuous feedback loop. So it's very important to have uh, this as an ongoing process. Thank you. Yes, all right. Thank you very much for uh, very useful answers. Well, Miss Gina, uh, I've got a question from the participant. Uh, dear Miss Gina, would you please share your experience? How is in your country about the awareness and cooperation of students to follow this remote learning? And what are the ways to succeed remote learning? Because in our country, in Indonesia, I could say students and the lecturer themselves mostly are doubt of this method. Especially, I'm now based on vocational college. We are more to practical and field assessment. We are struggling on remote learning. So <laughs> Both lecturers and students 
are performed and supportive with this remote learning. Okay. okay. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a very good question, but unfortunately, I cannot answer it because, like I said, we have not started with our online learning and teaching yet. We will be starting this August 24 when classes start. So for now, I have no experience in online teaching and learning yet. We are still in the preparation stage. In fact, our, our training will start, our LMS training will start next week. So unlike uh, the first speaker, the professor, he's already had experience in it. Yeah, I can share, thank you. But I, I think I can share a, a bit. Is it okay? Sure. Uh, the moderator. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, so regarding the training, the teaching at the vocational school, right? Is it? Um, am I right? Uh, vocational. Vocational. Yeah, for vocational school or vocational program. Uh, so of course, for vocational, we do have the practical side and uh, uh, somehow the theoretical side. But of course, uh, what we are trying to do for the student, uh, if we cannot bring the student to the lab, for example, then there will be different kind of virtual lab these days, uh, virtual lab. And we tend to have some kind of simulation video uh, describing, imitating exactly what the, uh, what the student should do for some certain kind of, uh, for some certain kind of uh, vocation. Uh, so I did experience the same questions uh, when we have the uh, conference at our university. Uh, for example, they said that nowadays there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of facility which are modern, uh, which are well equipped in the company. But during the <laughs> pandemic time and because of this and because of that, the university or the school are not well equipped with such kind of uh, facility. How can we help the student? Okay, so I said, of course, what we are training the student is to train them the way to do. We are not train them to uh, become a kind of uh, the only practitioner. So in some very special cases, a moment like the pandemic, even if it may extend, it may be uh, until the end of the year, for example, then we try our best uh, to uh, coach them <laughs> online or to coach them by using different kind of simulation video. But of course, we don't expect them to achieve uh, the result as full as 100% like in the real classes. But are you sure that when we take the student to the real lab room, are all of them learning? We yeah. still cannot guarantee such a thing. Now, going back to our situation, we train the student to become maybe the self-learner uh, so that in whatever context, they will continue to learn. They will continue to learn. So we, they, they may learn the philosophy, they may learn the principle in the uh, classroom context with the simulation video and so on, which are available in terms of the resources. It's available by the cloud technology these days. So you have plenty of that, right? So when they get out of the school to go to the uh, company to work, then they have to know how to continue learning and improve their own skill. So I believe that within this kind of disruption period, uh, the students should even be trained to become more independent learners. And that would be really important and critical to the development of the student. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Huang and Ms. Gina. Uh, your answers are clearly understood and hope the participant uh, really catch the answer. Well, uh, the next questions addressed to both of you. <laughs> I hope you can <laughs> uh, answer the questions. Uh, the question is about when learning to use gadgets, Many students spend more time for playing games or social media than accessing learning material. Even though we as teachers have made interesting learning materials in students' gadget, like learning videos, educational games, and anything else. So the question is, what is the strategy for students 
to spend more time in accessing learning material than games or social media. Okay. Miss Gina? Okay, I guess we go back to the regular uh, formative assessments. Um, it should be done in such a way that uh, our students are stimulated and they will access whatever lessons we have for them and the tasks that we have uh, already prepared for them. And uh, we have to set the deadline, of course. I mean, they're the ones who will give us their grades. We are not the one making the grades. So it's really up to them. We cannot just uh, spoon feed them. And like the, uh, the, the other speaker said, um, it's actually more of independent learning because uh, it's a synchronous and asynchronous. So we cannot be there all the time. Unlike in face-to-face -face classes, we are there right in front of them so we can monitor their learning. But in online learning, it's uh, the work is really uh, in their court. The ball is in their court. So we just have to set guidelines and give them the necessary tools and then probably just encourage them and then make our lessons uh, interactive and stimulating so that they will also be interested. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So setting deadline is one of the most important factors. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And regular formative assessment. Mm -hmm. Regular formative assessment. Great. Right. Okay, Mr. Huang. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. I do agree with uh, Professor Gina uh, regarding the regular deadline, the guideline, and the formative assessment. Um, in the way we teach, I'd like to add some more thing. Like in the way we teach, uh, probably sometimes the materials, I mean, the material for teaching and learning is really complicated, especially mm -hmm. in terms of teaching English, for example. Yeah. Uh, the students are given like two pages, uh, two page reading passage, for example. Mm -hmm. Then I would ask them uh, to prepare at home. Uh, then uh, what I expect them to do here is, okay, next time, I'm not going to teach you this uh, text. You are expected to do everything, to do whatever at home, but I will randomize or randomly select any of you um, to uh, present briefly in five minutes only, mm -hmm. summarizing the major content of the reading text, for example. Uh, yeah. Then, if you don't have, uh, if you cannot answer the whole group, or maybe you will be given uh, zero for that kind of component, for example. I, I tend to be strict in that way, but I'm serious. So that's the reason why the students say, at the beginning, I feel really uh, threatened or somehow uh, maybe really stressed. But yeah. later on, they find and they know uh, what I'm doing for them. So basically, um, they did. And uh, you know that after a while, uh, they come up with a very good way of self-improving or I name it as self-transforming uh, of their own of their own role as the learner so in that way I try my best to uh, give them a chance to reflect on their learning process mm -hmm. uh, helping them to identify their uh, roles as the learner so that later on they can help them, uh, they can help the other people by doing more or less in a similar way. Uh, okay, so that is a very important thing. Um, you know, uh, another example, like uh, I teaching uh, research method or even language assessment. So, you know, uh, the reading is too much, right? You know, uh, 20 pages or 30 pages per session and from different sources, I say, now, every session for the first 15 minutes, each of you should have question, and I uh, expect at least 10 questions in the class before I come. Or even if I come, if there's no question, then I would not start a class. I will start a class until I have question. You know, so one day the student may not know my style, and then they uh, started uh, sit down there and chatting or search surfing the internet, right, you know, so where's my question? So I would not teach, you know, I give them half an hour, okay, time wasting, but deserving. 
<laughs> you know, that's worth wasting time in that way to me. So after a while, they ask question, and then I would not be the one who answer the question. I would randomly choose any one of them answer the question. By doing so, I can double check, cross check back and forth uh, who already read the material, who haven't read, or who may need some kind of adjustment. And my lecture would go after. So, you know, um, I would believe that it would depend on how we really plan for the student to think and to learn in a particular way so that you know that they are really proactive, they are really active in the way they learn. Okay, so this is my experience in doing so. So even for the online session, I would do the same and they have to experience the same way and they did well. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Very good. Uh, it's very informative and applicable answers. Yeah. We can apply uh, this method from Ms. China and Mr. Wang to our institutions. Well, uh, the last questions. <laughs> last question goes to Mr. Huang from yeah. Ms. Indri from Harapan Bangsa University. Uh, she asked about how about your institution? I mean, the way to solve the problem about the student in the remote area with limited access to the internet. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. But luckily, you know, in the context of Vietnam, um, although uh, we are the developing country, uh, but um, we try our best to uh, provide uh, internet access even to the remote area. Uh, many of our students uh, went back to the countryside and even the mountainous area and you know that um, uh, some telecom company, uh, they work well with the ministry. So right at the beginning, no, uh, maybe the second week of the pandemic period, uh, the Ministry of Education worked with the Ministry of Communication and Transport. Uh, uh, both of them worked together and asked the uh, big corporation in charge of uh, telecommunication to provide internet access uh, to different remote area. And uh, even there are different kind of um, increasing updating of the speed of the, uh, the, the, the broadband of the internet access in the remote area. Uh, so we try uh, our best to give the student uh, the best choice. Um, so probably thanks to that, the student can really access the internet. Uh, however, we also encourage the student, but we do respect them. At the first two weeks uh, of the pandemic uh, area during the social distancing, um, uh, the student are advised or receive the online and uh, public announcement saying that in the next two weeks we will start online session and the students should be well prepared for such online session. So the student may go to the cafeteria or anywhere. So it's especially in the context of Vietnam, internet is available everywhere, I think. Uh, so <laughs> I think that might be uh, even more convenient. Um, I travel to a number of other countries in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, sometimes it's difficult for me to access the internet, even at the hotel, uh, because I am the international, for example. But uh, in our context, in the cafeteria or in the uh, hotel or any public places, we can access internet quite easily. So with the cell phone, uh, with the smartphone these days, the student can really already attend our uh, session, our online session. So um, to some extent, we have tried our best to manage. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Huang. Well, uh, hopefully those explanations really answer all questions from the participants. And really, it's really interesting discussions. But you know, we have to come to the next uh, panel discussions. Well, ladies and gentlemen, all questions have been answered by our two great presenters. Let's thank to Ms. Gina and Mr. Huang for their useful and interesting presentation and discussion today. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank Let's you. Hear. Can I say one word before you start? Christina, <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can Can I say something before the the next uh, start? Yeah. Please. Um, yeah. Be, uh, yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to uh, express my serious uh, appreciation uh, to the organizer. Uh, who have invited me to share during this uh, period. Uh, I would get uh, back to my room because the meeting will be until I'm afraid that I might not be able to join uh, the remaining session because I will have to present at about 3 p.m. Uh, soon in the next five minutes. So I would uh, ask for your permission to leave the online uh, webinar uh, soon. Uh, so thank you so much. And I would hope to uh, see you around maybe online virtually or face to face either here or either in Malaysia, in the Philippines or in Indonesia or in other country. Uh, so I would uh, say once again, thank you so much for your kindness and uh, all the best to everyone, uh, the organizer, the speaker, the presenter and all the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Huang. Thank you, Ms. Juna. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. See you. All right. Uh, the next presentation. Yeah. Back to the room. Okay. So, the next presentation about digital transformation of learning in Universitas Technocrat Indonesia, optimizing the use of learning management system. LMS during disruption COVID era will be given by Mr. Akhyarido MA PhD. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now let's invite Mr. Akhyarido MA PhD to join us. Hi, everyone. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Akhyar. Hello, good afternoon. Is my voice audible? Yes, it's clear enough. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Akhyar, for being one of the great presenters in our webinar today. Welcome. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before Mr. Akhyar delivers his presentations, I will read his bio. Mr. Akhyar is the Dean of Faculty of Arts and Education at Universitas Technocrat Indonesia. He has graduated from Universitas Pajajaran for his BA English Letters. He has attended his master and PhD from the National University of Malaysia, majoring English language studies. He has got many professional experiences. <laughs> he has become ex external supervisor and examiner at PhD in linguistic program, Faculty of Cultural Science, Universitas Pajajaran. He is also a visiting researcher at the University of Western Australia academic fellow at the Nationality, National University of Malaysia. And ladies and gentlemen, he has also has created many publications, and one of them is about cohesive conjunction and so as discourse strategies in English native and non-native engineers, lectures, a purpose-based study. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have a presentation from Mr. Akhyar. Mr. Akhyar, the time for you to present is for about 20 minutes. Okay. So, Mr. Akhyar, time is yours. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I hope that this uh, topic can add to the existing body of the literature. Um, Dr. Gina has presented you um, some issues in uh, Filipino, uh, the Philippines perspective, and Dr. Lee also uh, presented about the situation in Vietnam. So I hope that because we have um, quite a typical demography of, um, of the state, you know, with 100 millions of populations, with, um, you know, emerging country status. So I hope that um, this presentation will be uh, relevant. So while other presenters are uh, looking at the micro uh, perspective of this issue, so I'm going to look this into a broader perspective, um, into a macro level, maybe 
this can be uh, institutional policy and it's related to um, not ex exclusively on the higher uh, learning institution, but also uh, in the school levels. Uh, before that, I would like to introduce you to Universitas Technocrat Indonesia first. Next slide, please. Okay, this is our university. Our university uh, is uh, uh, in the center of Bandar Lampung, the capital of um, Lampung province uh, with 10 million populations. So this is our uh, buildings, our campus area. Next. So uh, facts and figures of, of our university. Uh, our university was started in 2000. So actually the roots of the university is information technology and foreign language. So I will tell you later why um, this, um, what is that? Um, digital transformation and LMS are very relevant to us. So our university is also dubbed by um, Ministry of Education of the Champion University with some reasons, number one. We really love our students to be uh, flying colors, to be uh, champions in anything. So principally, we receive uh, students uh, from senior high school who have uh, champion any kind of competitions um, uh, in the provincial and international levels, even international levels. So then our basis of scholarships also is based on uh, achievements or uh, um, awards received by the students in uh, national and international competitions. So that's make our uh, university is dubbed as the champion university. So we really encourage students to compete inside and outside of the campus, uh, inside the country and outside the country as well. So to introduce you, we have three faculties, uh, faculty of uh, computer sciences and engineering, uh, faculty of uh, economics and business and faculty of uh, arts and education, and I belong to uh, faculty members in uh, arts and education. So our student body right now is around 7,000 with more than 200 staffs. So what is interesting is that our campus got uh, an award from Compass Gramedia as Creative Technology uh, Campus uh, uh, in, in Lampung province. And um, later I will explain to you that our LMS or learning management system or our online learning has been officially listed by Ministry of Education. So if you look at the list of Ministry of Education for uh, Indonesian campuses, there are around 200 uh, official um, learning management system or online learning platform, which is uh, approved by the government as it is the standard that it can be used by, uh, by people, uh, by the community. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, about digital transformations of learning, this uh, I will start. Uh, if you look at this uh, leaps yeah? here, um, I can say that uh, we've been establishing for 20 years. So we started in 2000. So here I label by myself that from 2000 and 2009 or early 2019, uh, I call it as pre-disruption or COVID era. And then uh, during disruption or COVID era is right now in 2000 until 2020. And then post-disruption COVID era from 2020 until when, we don't know. So uh, in general, if I can divide this into three uh, digital transformation of learning, if you look at the first uh, part or the, the, the first uh, phase, which is pre-disruption era, so actually, uh, before the dis disruption came, we have uh, implemented 20% of our, of our courses uh, uh, delivered online. So like me, I teach in, um, let's say, um, uh, English literature program. So we have, let's say, um, 50 courses and 10 of them uh, actually uh, delivered online. So uh, to, to, to be able to to access this course, the students uh, didn't have to come to campus. So they can do it online full from the beginning until the end. They, they just uh, had to come to, to get briefings from the lecturer, from the teacher, from the professor about what to do for the, the, the semester. And then for other 80% of the courses, it, 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 it is um, delivered uh, blended. Blended means that 20 until 50% uh, uh, delivered online and uh, 50 until 80% um, face to face. So that's actually what's going on. 
And then during the pre-disruption COVID era, 2000 until 2019, all of the practicum of uh, practical uh, works uh, was done face to face in the labs, yeah, or uh, in the in the fields. So basically, this is what happens. Now we enter uh, disruption or COVID era. Yeah, we started the COVID uh, early 2000 actually, uh, but then in Indonesia and exclusively in Lampung. Uh, we really uh, got the impact of this disruption of COVID uh, in March. Actually, it was in March. Uh, I, I, I still remember that actually Jakarta planned to shut down the, the city uh, when I was in Jakarta, actually. So lucky I, I, I went back to, to my province, to my city, Lampung. Then right after that, uh, Jakarta closed the city. So uh, in the middle of March, I, I could still recall that it was... Uh, fourth or fifth week of our running semester. So we had to, to transform the, the, the teaching and learning mode into full 100% online for both uh, teaching uh, uh, lectures and everything and practicum of blended learning. So I will explain to you later uh, what's going on. Next slide, please. So actually, uh, we go back to pre-disruption uh, COVID era. So you know the difference between the pre during and the post later on. So this is the common uh, lectures or classes or teaching and learning in our university. So we like meeting the students. We like conducting the class. So this is me and my students in the class. Next slide, please. So our campus is also very active inviting uh, guests to, to, to the campus. So on the left, this, this happened uh, in 2019. We, uh, we invited 19 uh, professors and postgraduate students from Croatia. To, so we, we, we conducted joint seminars. And here on the right side, uh, we invited also a guest lecture from uh, United States, the, uh, the Consulate General of the Indonesian uh, Embassy in, from Houston, Texas. So we also invited our colleagues from Universitas Pajajaran to conduct some workshop on on uh, research methodology and also uh, writing and publication with the students. I think from UNPAD, it was around uh, 20 lecturers and teachers. So we have also students uh, and lectures from Infrastructure University Kuala Lumpur and many more came to our campus uh, for uh, collaboration of uh, seminars, workshop and anything. So this is actually the common scenario during pre-disruption COVID era. Next slide, please. And we also regularly conducted a uh, leadership and cultural program. We have leadership program for students. We have a lot of uh, cultural program for our guests as well. Uh, and, and this is what, 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 what is happening. Next. So sports are actually our main attention as well. We like our students doing sports and they achieve uh, a lot of achievements from, from uh, sports. So last year we conducted uh, basketball, national basketball championship, and then futsal, and then karate, and then pencaksilat, and many uh, sport events. We also next, we also uh, visited uh, many countries, uh, our, especially our lecturers and also our students. We visited Australia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, United States. Uh, to Sweden, to Finland, to Russia, to Uzbekistan. Uh, so many countries uh, our faculty members visited before the disruption and COVID era to excel and to, to collaborate, to engage with uh, a lot of parties. Next. So we send students also to a lot of competitions that I have told you in the beginning. So our, our university is a champion university. We like our students to compete outside. So this is when one of our students from sport department uh, became uh, the champion of international karate uh, competition in Surabaya. This is our students, English students won uh, scientific paper presentation in Universitas Indonesia. And this one is our robotic team who won ASEAN, you know, Southeast Asian uh, level event. Uh, it's a robot or underwater uh, robots. And also, this is from IT competition, IOT, uh, uh, in uh, University of Indonesia, mistaken. So we actively participated in competition. Next. And
And even this is uh, in the beginning of this year, we uh, visited some of the universities. We talked about what is the possible collaboration and engagement that we can do together in teaching and learning and research in, in, in um, uh, what is that? Uh, social services and in student affairs. So here on the left side, we visited Universitas Gajah Mada, and then we signed MOUs and to Universitas Negeri uh, Jakarta, and also this one to Universitas Indonesia, and also to UNPAD. So basically, we like visiting others, and we like uh, people come to our campus to collaborate. So actually, uh, during the pre-disruption COVID era, our campus uh, was full of people every day from Monday until Sunday. So students were everywhere. They, they, they could use all the facilities. They could stay on campus 24 hours a day because we want our students to be active, to be, uh, to be um, excellent both in hard and soft skills. Next. But what happened? This is the first day when we closed our campus and uh, for, forbid our students to come because of COVID. So when the government also announced about um, the, the dangers yeah, of, of, of COVID and then all of the university and schools must be closed because of this, this is the situation of uh, our campus. So I came to campus on the first day of uh, the shutdown of campus and this is the situation is empty no students all the students were directed to go back to their home uh, to, to, to the country to, 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 to their family or maybe to stay in their dorms uh, or at homes so this is what happened so uh, we are thinking about what what would be the possible uh, directions that we have to do but lucky because we already had this LMS platform. It we we try to optimize. We we try to maximize uh, whatever the source that we have. We use that, and uh, on the journey, we keep improving what we need to, to, to improve. Next, please. So uh, I can tell you, this is the, the the period where we optimize the use of LMS yeah, during the disruption COVID era. So if I can divide the three uh, phases of our situation during uh, disruption COVID era, I can say that uh, we have phase one, LMS transition. What does it mean by LMS transition? So it started early this year. Uh, lecture, practicum or practical works, it's 100% online. So the university has decided that we use one official platform. So we use our own platform, we have it already. So why don't we use that as, as the source? But, you know, the university allowed lecturers, the faculty to use at their supporting platform. So basically in the beginning, in the first phase of uh, disruption COVID era, so uh, our LMS uh, is in tra was in tra uh, transition. So we use one official platform and two su supports. Now, right now, uh, in July, June, July, we are entering what we call as uh, LMS improvements. So lectures yeah, are 100% online uh, still. And then uh, we use two uh, official platforms now. We use two official platforms. I will explain to you later. And four uh, supports, uh, especially in my faculty, Faculty of Arts and Education. Then I think uh, it's also the same in other faculties. And practicum, what we plan is 50% 50 50 online. So later, uh, uh, the procedure will be uh, half of the capacity of the uh, labs uh, will be, I mean, students will take turns. So they will use, then we use all the protocols. Later, uh, it will be explained. Uh, and phase three, uh, we come to what we call as new normal or new culture, then what, what it would be. So. Uh, what I can tell you uh, now is that it's similar to phase two. We allow sports, you know, doing sports with uh, protocols. We already made the protocols and research and social services with protocols as well. And, you know, seminars, students present their thesis, um, a proposal and a thesis advisory and student activities also with uh, strict protocols. Next, next slide, please. So, uh, this is the two main official uh, LMS platforms that we have. Uh, number one, this is uh, the students 
and the lecturers must have the account or they must access this for especially teaching and learning process. Number one is the university open online course or we call it as SPADA Technocrat, Sistem Pembelajaran Dalam Jaringan Technocrat. And then number two, we have the university YouTube channel. All right, so this is our main official uh, platforms for teaching and learning now. And number two, uh, that's what we call a support system. Uh, so we allow our faculty, our uh, staffs, our students to use Zoom. Yeah, but then we have faculty and university official ID. So actually, um, we use a special ID to conduct uh, Zoom meetings. And then uh, we allow also our lecturer and students use Google Meet or Hangouts, but with the university official email community. So we have our um, uh, Gmail community. Uh, then we, we maximize uh, the features in Gmail. And then number three, this is pretty new. And this was inspired by our uh, academic, uh, sorry, uh, vice rector of academic affairs who look at the opportunities and possibilities for our students, especially final year, that they're writing a lot, they read a lot, they write a lot. So why don't we have this kind of platform? We have our uh, open journal system already in our um, faculties, but then we want to add a special OJS, yeah, open journal system, just for our students. So we just launched this this, uh, this June. So I think it was a pretty successful. So in my faculty itself, we, we successfully publish uh, like 20, 20 uh, articles, if I'm mistaken, then I will tell you further about this. And then in my faculty, especially, we have book writing program. So we, we used to, uh, I mean, we, we have, you know, uh, this book program, we, we, but we want to intensify that. Uh, We're quite lucky because in our faculty, we have English literature, uh, and then we have um, other programs as well, English, uh, English education, and then mathematics, and also sport. Then we have this uh, creative writing class, so students can store their works and facilitate it by the lecturers that they publish uh, their works. I, actually, this has been, um, uh, we've done this and we are still going to do this uh, until next year or until, until post-COVID era. All right, I will explain to you later one by one. So now we start from, next slide please. So we start from our LMS. This is the official of LMS. Actually, we have established our LMS uh, long before the term uh, uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0, disruptive, uh, or COVID, you know, came or pop out uh, and used uh, widely by people. So we we initiated this early uh, to two thousand actually, and this is our. Uh, old phase, we, we, we could say, so we in 2018 or 19, we changed it into new phase. So in the past, we call it student center e-learning environment. So I, uh, as long as I could remember, we have this, this uh, system very established uh, in 2009, this, this system, 2009. But then the prototype, the initiation was uh, established long before that. Next. So now this is our Spada Technocrat. So that scale A uh, is now transformed into Spada Technocrat. So if uh, there are our students in, in, in this uh, seminar or webinar, they know exactly what is this. So they're familiar with this. So only lecturers and, and students who have uh, a student number and then password who can access this. So they can basically find all of the subjects inside here. So this is the front page. Uh, next, please. So what, what the students can do uh, in this LMS? I think uh, it's like Dr. Gina said, they have some of the step, steps of activities in uh, what so-called their online learning platform later in August that they, they will implement. But then this is the thing that we have implemented at least uh, in the past uh, three, four years. Yeah, and then we keep improving this. Next. 
So this is the lecture page. Uh, you can, uh, when you enter the faculty page, then you can find names of lectures. So you can see my name here, Ayarido. So it means that when you find my name, it's in the Faculty of Arts and Education. Next, please. So when you click my name, you can see all of the courses or all of the page, uh, oh, sorry, all of the subjects that I teach during the semester. But then you can see uh, the courses or the subjects that I teach in the previous semester. Basically, this LMS also save yeah, the courses or the, the, the discussion or anything that already happened in the previous semester. So this is the page when I open uh, my course. Next. So principally, the standard that the university uh, set is actually the standard that the Ministry of Education and Culture set. So uh, when you open the course or the subject, you will directly get the course information. What is the name of the subject? What is the name of uh, the number of the credits? And then the, the code and then the, the prerequisite and you will find the learning objectives. You will find also uh the scoring systems references and so on so it will be displayed uh in the first page uh when you open uh the course next after that you will see the sessions here or the meetings meeting one meeting two meeting three meeting four with all of the topics with all of the topics so the students when they open they can directly see uh, the sessions or the meetings or the topics. Next. Now, when you click the topic, when the students click the topic, so we try to bring, uh, try our best to bring uh, reality into this LMS. So we start with opening. So normally in every session, we will start from, from opening. In the opening, we greet the students like we normally greet them in the class. So, Assalamualaikum or good morning or good afternoon. So today, in this meeting, we will uh, discuss about, or the topic will be about, so the objective or the learning objectives are stated here. So we also state the indicators yeah, of, of uh, successful learning here yeah, and uh, many others. Uh, basically, what you, you, you write in your lesson plans or syllabus must be put here. But then it, it, um, uh, we try our best to make it as sound, um, you know, as uh, synchronous as possible. Next. I'm so sorry, Mr. Rakyar, five more minutes. All right. So uh, this is the activities. After that, we have activities. So basically, in uh, our, the, the, the university, uh, university already standardizes uh, that uh, students must go through all of these uh, processes. Some is optional, like pre test but the rest is compulsory. The students have to go through all these activities one by one is pre-test. Number one, video. So video, we can take from other sources. And now we are improving that the video must be from the lecturers uh, themselves. So we, we, we establish a studio with a uh, cameraman and editor. So we, we, we make our own video uh, of teaching and learning and we post it in our e-learning system later, I will show you. And then after video of the teaching and learning, uh, uh, particularly about the uh, topics, so we put slides or reading materials to the students. So after listening, the students are exposed to reading as well. So like it was touched by Gina and and uh, and Lee, uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, students get bored. Uh, uh, Dr. Gina said 20 minutes is the maximum. So we try to even, you know, for the video is less than 15 minutes. So video. So we we put um, we it's not. Uh, uh, we put slots here, yeah. we put limits. For example, this activity must be done in 15 minutes, this time is 30 minutes. Then students have to attend forum. Forum means that they, they do discussion and post us, and then we add uh, assignment. Next. So this is uh, an example of the video presentation that, that was uploaded by one of my students in, in my LMS. So actually students can, uh, put their videos here. Also, they can put the links through uh, Google Drive, their Google Drive as well. But normally, uh, our students can pose it here. They can download their friends as well. They can watch it together. Uh, principally, it's very easy to use, but sometimes it depends on the internet connections about the durations, uh, how long you will upload the video. Next. 
and this is the discussion forum example of discussion so basically in discussion students uh, give feedbacks on the existing issues sometimes i floor uh, questions sometimes students present something and it has to be responded by their friends in the forum next uh, this is quiz quiz and exams is also uh, possible to be done in our lms so basically uh, for uh, multiple choice, essay, uh, true or false, everything can be accommodated through our LMS. Next. So this is our e-learning technocrat. So if you visit our YouTube channel, you can find uh, more videos right now because we keep improving our uh, uh, e-learning channel. So it's easily to be visited. So then when students uh, still don't understand about the materials, they can just watch uh, via YouTube. Next. So this is my video that the students can watch uh, in YouTube. Uh, next. OK, this is our secondary platforms that I said in the beginning that this is the supports. We still conducted meeting through Zooms. So basically, this is when I met my students on the left, uh, additional class or extra classes. When I found that some of the students got problems, then they need some refreshments through heart-to-heart uh, uh, -heart talks. So we, we, we were facilitated by Zoom meetings or by uh, Google chat rooms. And this is when I conducted meetings with lectures. Also, we conducted workshop here. And then two weeks ago, we conducted webinars with Harvard alumni. So it's also facilitated by uh, our Zoom, uh, uh, university and faculty Zooms. Next. Uh, this is what I told you in the beginning. So this is quite new and pretty new because I think that students could be very productive at home. So they could write, they have taken uh, writing subject, they have taken uh, research methodology subject, they have taken qualitative research, quantitative research, they have taken several classes. I think we, we have to appreciate and celebrate this by you know inviting them to, to, to find uh, a, a way to publish what they have done. So I think this will be good. So as long as, long as you are a student, you can publish in this uh, uh, journal platform. So this journal is only for the student. So we make it. So in our faculty, we have four. First, uh, in, uh, in English Literature Department, the name of Linguistic and Literature Journal, the name of the journal for the students. Next. This is for our English Language Department. This is especially dedicated for the students. So our students can collaborate with students from other universities as well. So if there are some students from uh, uh, other universities wanted to collaborate with our students. So this will be a good platform. And this year we are uh, processing the ISSN. So this will be going to the next level, but then especially for our students next. I'm really sorry, uh, Mr. Rathiar, the time is over. I think you can come up with the conclusion of your presentation. Okay, uh, can you show me next two slides? I will conclude there. Next, next okay. Two okay here so uh this is very interesting uh we cannot look down look down to our students that they couldn't do anything uh during this disruption uh COVID era so i think if we we are able to facilitate them to encourage them to be more productive at home from their uh, uh hometown i think they could possibly more productive and more elevated in terms of knowledge and experience and this make them become more independent but I'm sure that students have some issues as well, like uh, networking and also maybe quota or something like that. And also the stress because of overloads of works. But I think we, it's very possible that we can go through these difficult times and I'm confident about it. Thank you so much. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon. Waalaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Rakyat. Wow, uh, it's very informative and inspiring presentations. Well, uh, later on, we can have a question and answer. Okay, Mr. Rakia, thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the next presentation about how to engage your online students will be delivered by Ms. Tri Pujiani, MPD. Hi, Ms. Ani, how's life today? Ms. Ani? Yeah. I'm good, sir. And you? How are you? I'm great. Pleased to meet you, Miss Annie. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Uh, how about my voice? Is it clear? Yes, that's clear. 
really okay. clear. All right, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before Miss Annie commences her presentations, I would like to read her CV. Miss Annie is the coordinator of English Education Department, and she is also the head of Language Development Center of Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Miss Annie has obtained her master and bachelor degree of English English language education, Sebelas Marat University. She is also a member of English Language Education Study Program Association or APSPBI Indonesia. Well, Miss Annie, the time for you to present is about 20 minutes. Miss Annie, the yeah. time is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Benny for having me here to share a piece of information related to online learning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Before I start my presentation, I'd like to say thank you for all the previous speakers, uh, Mr. Wang, Mrs. Gina, and Mr. Ahyar for the remarkable presentation. And here I'd like to talk about online learning also, but from the student's perspective, about how to engage your online students, okay? Without any further ado, let me start my presentation. Le next, please. Go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to have a kind of interactive questions. So I want to know your opinion about your online learning. Yeah, I believe that among the participants of this webinar are students and also teachers or lecturers. So I want to ask to you for the students, the question is on a scale of one to five, which five is the highest? How satisfied are you with the current online learning you get? And for the teacher or lecturers, the question is on a scale of one to five, which five is the highest? How satisfied you are, are you with the online learning that you conduct right now? Yeah, would you please answer my question on the chat box in YouTube or in zoom okay actually i need to know how far you have adapted to this online learning whether you have adapted well or you are still struggling on it because having online learning is not an option for us during this pandemic is that right it's a must especially in indonesia we should survive and make this disruptive situation to be challenged and also a chance to be better in the future okay uh yeah, well, actually, uh, okay, we've got some answer from Zoom chat for 3.5, 4, okay, thank you for the answers. Actually, I have done a survey also to my students related to their satisfaction uh, toward my online class, and this is the result you can see on the screen. Uh, most students stated that their satisfaction was on level 4, and some of the others stated it was 5. I really appreciate that. But based on this result, I think I myself still struggle on online learning because the average of their satisfaction level was only four, but it's okay. It's not the end, I think. We still have many chance to improve our quality of learning. And the key is that never stop learning. Yeah, next please. Well, I also have as, uh, have asked to my students to give feedback so related to their problem during the online learning and there are many problems that i got from the students but here i just show the top three of them the first problem is internet data of course we can't deny that during this pandemic not only for the online course but also for the other needs we spend more budget for internet data because everything goes to be online. So this is the problem of all of us, I guess. Is that right? And the second problem is internet connection. Yeah, as we know that our students come from many areas and the geographical of this country makes the strength of the internet connection is not equal in all areas. And also there are many other factors causing this to be the problem. Even some students taught me that they need to struggle to get good connection to access the online learning material, such as going somewhere or staying awake at night. I'm really sorry to hear that. 
And the third problem is about the assignment. During this pandemic, the reports of stress increases dramatically and it's dominated by the students. I do understand that we as the lecturer or teacher give more assignment or quizzes on the online course on purpose. And the purpose are to stimulate the students to have self-learning, to be creative, to explore more knowledge about the topic discussed. But we need to consider some things here, such as first, does the assignment given really measure the student's competence or is just to replace your existence in the classroom? Because sometimes too many assignments will make the students skip the learning material and just go forward to the assignment. And the second, make sure that the assignment worth it with the effort that the students need. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah. Here are the students' preference on online learning. First, about the learning method. I asked to my students when the pandemic is over and the teaching and learning back to normal, which one do you prefer, online, offline, or blended learning? And 57.4% said blended, 36.7% said offline, and 2.1% said online. It means that also at the first time they were forced to have online learning, but actually they don't totally dislike this learning method. Most of them want to have blended learning. It means that we mix between online and offline learning. And second about the learning style, it's unpredictable for me that 92.9% or almost all of my students have audiovisual learning style. So I think transforming the teaching presentation in the form of video is a good idea. But we need to make sure that the video of our presentation is clear enough, clear in the visual and also clear in the audio. And again, it's our challenge as a teacher to be creative in making the teaching media. And later after my presentation, my colleague, Mr. Ali, will explain more detail about the teaching media. Okay, let's go to the third chart. This is about the length of the video. 78.7% .7 of the students prefer short video. I think this is normal because the students commonly can keep their concentration only on about the first 10, 20 minutes. More than that, they will be easily distracted or even sleepy. Okay, well, on the next slide, I will start to give some tips about how to engage the students in online course in which these tips were taken based on the feedback from my students and also my own self-reflection as a teacher. And the first tip is training instructors in online learning. This is the first thing we should do before conducting an online learning. Online learning is something new for most of us. So before we dip ourselves into it, we need to know what is inside and how to survive there. Uh, fortunately, far before this pandemic occurred, the Directorate of Higher Education has facilitated us, especially lecturers, with some trainings on online learning system. And moreover, I also feel proud of my institution, Universitas Harapan Bangsa, for being responsive toward the issue of the closing of offline and offline teaching and learning. Yeah, UHB has facilitated all the staff to have online learning training by using Salsa right before the implementation of staying at home rule. Yeah, just for your information, Salsa is the student-centered activities and learning of Harapan Bangsa. It's used by UHB to conduct uh, online learning. This is a kind of Moodle platform. Okay, in addition, trend instructor will increase the student's trust toward the online course. It can actually be seen from the quality of the course itself. And it will motivate the students to learn. Uh, however, for those who didn't get training of online learning, you don't need to worry because you can also learning by doing and you still have many chance to get training from many sources. One of them is by joining webinar like this. So I think this is a good idea for you to join this webinar. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. The second tip is rethinking the lecture format. What I mean here is we need to review our syllabus or lesson plan. We should classify the topics or the activities that can be transformed into online and the ones that cannot. The activities that cannot be done online, for example, is 
the activities that need specific equipment that only provided in the laboratory, or the activities that require the students to go some places in which it is closed or restricted during this pandemic. So for those kind of activities, we need to change them into the other activities that possible to be done online. But make sure that the competence covered on those activities are the same. Or the other possible solution is by postponing it to the next semester activities and take the materials from the next semester to be taught this semester as the exchange. So during this online learning, we more focus on the theory and later when the pandemic has been over, we can do practicum activities. Something like that. Next, please. Well, the third tip is choosing the platform or media. Yeah. The things to be considered in choosing the platform, for example, first, we must be familiar with the platform. We can operate it well. Even we can explore all the features to provide uh, to support our learning. And the common platform used, for example, Moodle, yeah, just like Salsa that we use in UHB, Google Classroom, Schoology, Edmodo, and, and so on. Or it's also a good idea to utilize social media such as Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, Telegram, etc. And the second thing to consider is that the platform must be easily accessed by the teacher and the students. And also it can make the communication between them easier. You can also combine the platform, for example, by using Moodle and WhatsApp, Google Classroom and Instagram and so on. Next, please. And the fourth tip is being organized, especially in organizing the meeting. And the page should be able to communicate to the students so that they understand what they should do in this course, especially in meeting by meeting. Okay, so you can look at the picture. This is the example of the course that I conduct this semester. And this is quite, actually quite the same as the LMS owned by Universitas Technocrat Indonesia because it's Moodle platform, I think. And then, yeah, I know it's still far from perfect, but it's okay. I will use it to explain the components of each meeting based on the standard applied in UHB. Okay, the first part is cover, yeah. The pictures on the top corner, it is the cover. The role of this cover is really important because this is the first impression that the students will get. Besides to beautify the page, cover is also necessary to introduce the students to the name of the course and also the lecturers. And under the cover, I put the greeting for the students. This is used to make the students feel welcome to the course. And next, under the greeting, I post the identity of the course to inform the students about the detail of the course. This is needed to make the students understand about what they are going to learn this semester and what they have to do to pass this course. And the next is the example of one of the meeting. Yeah, on the left corner, this is the sample of one of the meeting on the name of the topic. I put the date to tell the students about when this meeting can be accessed. And I also put the name of the lecturer because in this course, the lecturers are in a team. So it's to inform the student about who handled this meeting. So if later there are something to ask about this topic, the students may contact the lecturer. And one of the important thing on each meeting is the objectives of the meeting. So under the topic, I usually inform the students about the materials they are going to learn and what skill they will get after learning this material. Then the components of each meeting are at least consists of for room video presentation, quiz, and attendance list. The order of these components must tell to the students the learning steps of this meeting. For example, I usually use forum in two ways. First, as the brainstorming, and second, as the discussion. So when I use it as brainstorming, I put it at the top of the meeting. But when I use it for discussion, so I put it at the end of the meeting. And then the video presentation. It is the lecturer video in explaining the material just like in the classroom. So I put it after the brainstorming forum. Then the quiz is used to give practice or drilling. So I put it after the video presentation. And for the production, I usually combine some things in one production. 
because as I said before, too many assignments will burden the students a lot and it may make them stressful. So the last, don't forget to put the attendance on each meeting for the attendance report. Yeah, that's all the components of each meeting. And then next, please. Okay, the fifth tips is welcoming the students. As I said before, that welcoming the students is important in order to engage the students to the course. Yeah, in my opinion, at least once at the beginning of the course, we need to have meeting conference so that the lecturers and also the students can meet together face to face. I know the students will not like this because usually meeting conference take a lot of internet data. So make this meeting as brief as possible, but meaningful. The main purpose of this meeting is to introduce the lecturers with the students and vice versa. Yeah, it's to avoid the feeling that we teach uh, invisible students and the students are told by course because we don't know each other. Yeah, so we need to know each other actually. From this meeting, we also will know the student's attitude or the student's behavior so we can predict the best way to handle them in the future. And the other purposes of this meeting are to explain the syllabus of the course and to have sharing time. Here, the student may share their problem last semester and their expectation this semester. So the teachers can give the solution and provide the learning process that meets the student's needs. Okay. Next, please. I'm so sorry, Miss Annie, you still have yeah. five minutes remaining. Okay, yeah, I will make it quick. Right, the next, please. Right, the six tips is setting the goals. This is still related to the syllabus in wel and welcoming meetings. So when the lecturer explains the syllabus, make sure that the students really understand about what they are going to learn, what they should do during this course, what, they are, what are their rights and responsibility and the requirement to pass this course. This will keep in their mind that although they are learning independently, but they have framework about what to do. Next, please. Right, the seven tips is that chunk it. Chunk it means put the material of each meeting in a piece of brief and clear information and focus on one topic only. Yeah, as I said before, that the ability to keep focused on uh, one thing is limited. So most students can only concentrate in 20 minutes and after that, they need to refresh their mind before continuing their study. Therefore, a short presentation video is highly recommended. Next, please. Okay, the next tips, the eight tips is playing and gamifying the activities. Yeah, boring is a big problem for me too, actually. Staying at home with a book of learning assignment, of course, it's boring. And this feeling may cause laziness in learning. And when they are forced to study, it may increase the risk of stress. And concerning on this, the teacher must be, must be creative in managing the meeting. Besides the interesting teaching presentation, the teacher should also provide credit activities that stimulate learning in an interesting way. For example, by giving the uh, quiz with various questions and also interesting feedback at the end of the quiz when, they, when the students get certain score. For example, a uh, good job when they get eight, Marvelous when they get nine and you did it when they get 10, something like that. And the other example is by giving assignment that bring the students out of their gadget for a while. So uh, for example, giving the mini project that they can do by themselves at home. Okay, next please. The ninth tip is monitoring the progress and giving feedback. This is the thing that sometimes being forgotten. We are too busy in preparing the material, but we forget to check their progress. We don't give it back and even we forget that they exist, maybe. And sometimes we check their work and then it's done and that's all. And we think that giving feedback is only for those who find any problems in learning, but actually it's not true. Feedback is also necessary for those who have accomplished the thing, have accessed the materials and also have done the quiz or assignment. This feedback may be used, uh, maybe the motivation for the students to be better on the next assignment. So at least the lecturer must check the students programs on the online learning once a week so that when there is any problem, it can be detected soon. And the point is that a good communication is required to keep the students and the lecturer connected. Next, please. 
Okay, the 10 tips is encouraging self-assessment. Self-assessment is an individual review performed to identify elements that can be improved or exploited to achieve certain predefined goals. Uh, first, the student must determine their target of his meeting or their passing grade. It may be different from one student and the other depending on their self-confidence toward their ability. And the important thing is that it must be higher than the course passing grade, of course. And then the lecturer facilitates the students with quizzes that allow several attempts. So when on the first attempt, the student's score is still under their passing grade, they can retake the quiz to get better score. And the point is that the students are the one who assess whether they have reached the target or not. We as the lecturer just facilitate them to reach it. In addition, the more quizzes they take, the more practice they have. Is that right? Right, next please. Yeah, the 11 tips is being practical. Having online learning, of course, promotes self-learning. Each individual has their own characteristic, has their own learning style, and has different business. So one of the benefits of online learning is that it's asynchronous, as said by the previous speakers. Asynchronous means that the learning process doesn't require the students and the teacher to be at the same time and at the same place. So it's flexible in which it can be accessed anytime and anywhere but i know that we have meeting sequence that must be completed so flexible here means that we should give a range of time for the students to access the meeting for example one week for each meeting so the student have one week to learn the material to do the assignment and to assess the child if they have reached the target or not and the important thing is that we should provide the rundown meeting with the timeline so the student can manage the time by themselves next please Okay, this is the 12 tips, the last tips for me. Uh, it is updating the content. Teachers that have taught for a long time, of course, have mastered the knowledge that they teach very well. They don't need many preparation before teaching because the materials have been ready and used several times before. However, as the life changes, the trends also change. The topic that was well known 10 years ago may be strange for a current student. So using the topic that's familiar to the student will make it easier to be understood. Moreover, it will make the student feel involved in the discussion because the topic relates with them. So my point is that always be up to date to the current issue and adjust the topic with the background of the students. Next. Well, the last but not least, I'd like to suggest to all teachers here to promote lifelong learning. Also, we are the source of the students' knowledge right now but it's not the end of the learning. Knowledge is borderless and developing every time. So once you stop learning, we will be left far behind. And for the students, I suggest you to be autonomous. So you are the subject of the learning itself. So you are the one who is responsible for your own achievement, not the teacher. Okay, that's all my presentation. Before I uh, give the time back to the moderator, I'd like to take this chance to give a big appreciation to all my students for the active participation in my class so far. Uh, my students are my motivation and also my inspiration to be better every time. I love you all, my students. Okay, thank you very much. That's all my presentation. The moderator, time is yours. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Annie. What an informative and interesting presentation. Thank you, Ms. Annie. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we still have one last great speaker. He is Mr. Muhammad Soali, MPD. He is going to present about utilizing online platform for making instructional media. Welcome, Mr. Ali. Yeah, hello, Mr. Ali. How's life with you today, Mr. Ali? Okay, very good. What about you, Mr. Ali? I'm fine. Thank you, Mr. Ali. Mr. Ali, uh, the time for you to present is for about 20 minutes. Okay. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before his presentation begins, I will read his CV. Mr. Ali has obtained his master on English education from Yogyakarta State University. Mr. Ali is an English lecturer at Universitas Harapan Bangsa, and he is also the chief editor of 
Journal of English and Economy and Law of Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Ali. Hello, Mr. Benny. Hi, Mr. Ali. You can get started. Please. Okay. Is it clear, my voice? Very clear. Okay. Okay, first of all, I want to say thanks to Mr. Benny as the moderator, and then to the old committee who has given me a chance so um, I can be here. Yeah, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah, well, everyone, yeah, the concept of online learning has been conveyed, yeah, very well done by our remarkable speakers, Mr. Huang, and then Ms. Gina, and then um, Mr. Ahyar, and Ms. Ami. Now, yeah, on today's occasion, um, let me share um, my uh, material, namely about uh, the instructional media, actually. Um, it is kind of more simple and uh, practical, namely about how to make the, what is it, uh, animated video. Yeah. Uh, I hope that uh, this tutorial uh, can give the benefits yeah, for the online, learn online learning. Well, everyone, um, the growth of the computer capacity leads to more widely use of multimedia instruction. Um, the including use of the animated video. The first and the foremost reason for um, using the animated video is that the first it is a, what is it? It is a rich media. Yeah. Uh, let me show you. Where is my PowerPoint? Can you show me uh, the committee? Okay, here it is. Um, well, let me repeat. The first and the foremost reason for um, using animated video is that um, it is a rich medium, right? Since the visual appeals to our sense. And the second one is that the visual media also offer us kind of easy and um, effective way to communicate the important messages. And, I'm so mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah. Uh, there isn't any screen? Yeah. Screen? Uh, I have already shared the screen. OK. Can you watch it? No, we, we can't. OK, maybe from the committee, can you help us? Okay, uh, try to share the screen. Very good. Okay, Mr. Benny, can you see that? Yes, yes, it's it's clear. All right. Okay, all right. Well, let me continue. Okay. Um, the best part is that a visual can be consumed more easily than a text. It can give the impact yeah, to our students because based on the visit, for about 90% um, of the information transmitted to our brain actually is in the visual. So the visual media itself um, are processed for about um, 60,000 times faster in our brain than the text. And that's why uh, we suggest yeah, the teacher or the lecturer to uh, what is it make this animated video and then uh, the last um, this animated video of course can gain the learner action um, but unfortunately yeah for uh, what is it creating the 
instructional um, media can be time and resource consuming. Yeah. Therefore, um, they need a simple and then uh, effective way yeah, um, or effective or alternative ways, um, namely the online platform to make the animated video. And then the good news, yeah, there are several kinds of online platform which provide um, low-cost educational animation video. Yeah. Um, and uh, in this case, there are uh, Powtoon, yeah, you can use, yeah. Uh, actually, it provides um, many characters um, that you can use in your animated video. And then uh, there also, um, what is it? If you want to make uh, animated hand, you can use uh, a video sprite. And then there is Movely. And the last one, there is the animator. And then on this um, today occasion, uh, we are going to make the video using a platform animator. Maybe it's more kinds of uh, tutorial, yeah. And then yeah, this is a simple uh, example of animated video that I made using animator.com. If you are uh, creative, you can be uh, more, what is it, interesting, yeah? Create interesting video. Mr. Ali, uh, is there any audio for your video? Yes. Audio sound, I mean the sound cannot be heard. Okay, that's the sample, yeah? Hello, Mr. Benny, can you hear my voice? Yes, yes, I can. I mean your, your video, there isn't any sound of your video.
to insert your audio, you can also do that um, using the feature uh, in animator.com. Uh, and then um, to the tutorial, here we are going to um, practice how to make it yeah, using the platform. So um, here we go. Well, everyone, on today's occasion, we are going to learn about how to make animated video using Animaker. To create animation in Animaker, you should sign up first. Actually, there are two ways you can do to sign up. The first one is using Facebook account or using your Google account. Well, if you have already an account, just click directly sign in button and you will be directed to the interface of animaker.com well to start creating video the animator provides you several frames like horizontal vertical square youtube frame and the others um, i usually utilize the horizontal one and here are the templates provided you can select as you need um, if you are a teacher, you can use this template or you can also use this one But maybe you need to modify it a little bit Well, in the end of itself, uh, basically it is divided into four simple parts The first one is right here, it is called as a um, workspace Where you are going to be doing all your outside creation to the right I've seen, which you will be using to make your amazing video. But I remind you, it is better for you to think about the concept or draft for every single scene here. For sure, it will make you easier. Well, in the bottom, we have the timeline where you can control when your characters come in, when different effects come in, and then when they roll out, all of that are right here. And to the left, it is a massive library where you can go ahead and then find any characters like object, animated text, music, background, and everything to make your video just seem that much better. So let's start creating our awesome video. Um, this is the interface of animaker.com. First up, we start from the character. If we go and click any characters over here, you can change the character as you want. Yeah, some of them you can see are fully, and some of them are dead. So you can see when I click the character, the option here appear directly. To the workspace. You will also notice that little purple bar comes on to the timeline. So this is how long the character is going to stay on the timeline and you can see that. Let's just call him as John and John will be staying on your timeline from the first second all the way to the 10 second. Yeah, if I don't want to see it, it should be this long, like say 
one second. All I have to do is go ahead and click on this little minus button. And if, if I want to make the scene a little bit longer, I just have to go and click on this little plus button right here. So I'm just going to use this to say five or seven seconds up to you. We can also change the way we act right now. And with that, I mean, um, we are going to give him an action and an expression. So with the action over here, you can see that for the characters. This entire windows shows a bunch of different actions that our characters can do. Well, uh, we can see because he is um, greeting us, we can use this action and use the expression as well. Look, he is looking at us very happily. I'm just go and click this happy expression. Well, we are going to go ahead and start out by greeting all the students. Uh, take an example, hello students. Now we can edit or change it into animated text by clicking on this little button right here. You will get a bunch of different text options. You can also create your own text. Yeah, you just have to click right here. Sorry, five minutes left for your presentation. Okay, Mr. Benny. Yeah. Well, everyone, you can also add more some text like who are you doing? Just click the animated text. Yeah, who are you doing? Forget to click the purple button in the timeline to make it um, appear till the end of the scene. And then we review it by hit the scene button. simple as just clicking on a little plus button or you can use a uh, duplicate button on the second slide um, we can remove unnecessary object like this layer nice little background and let's just say I want to get a nice password so there are a bunch of different background that we do have and choose whichever you want now we go ahead to change the action of the character he is going to explain the today's talk So I think this expression would be the best. Well, Mr. Ali, you still have to I think we can come to a conclusion. Yes, so, um, smaller or bigger, you can match with the background.
now and uh, to customize the deck we can create the one for example we can write this we are going to learn about internal organs Okay, well done. On your right, on the Windows bar, you can also change the type of font and then um, the size of letter and the color. And you may also add the animated effect to your writing. For example, pop up like this. Now we review it. Just click the scene button. Okay, very well done. Now let's add another scene. To this point, we teach internal organs. I'm so sorry, uh, Mr. The time we yeah, go for the game Really interesting. Yeah, well, everyone. Um, Okay, well, everyone, because our time is limited, um, you can ask over this or um, you can contact me if you want. And that's the simple video I made using the animator. If you want to learn more, yeah, you can uh, watch it next time. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Benny, for the time given to me. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much to Mr. Ali for your such an applicable and useful material. Thank you once again, Mr. Ali. Okay, my pleasure, Mr. Benny. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, and all distinguished webinar participants, before coming to the Q&A session, we will have an interactive quiz, which is going to be carried out by Quip. Quip is an international affairs and marketing office so, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Aldi. Good afternoon, Mr. Aldi. Hi, Mr. Aldi. Are you with us? Mr. Aldi. Hello, Mr. Hi, Mr. Aldi. How are you? Hello, Mr. Ben. I'm fine. All right. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a quiz. So, Mr. Aldi, time is yours. Yeah. Terima kasih banyak, Mr. Benny. Yeah. Sekarang waktunya quiz. Lagi-lagi quiz. Quiz lagi. Quiz lagi. Quiz terus. Hanya di Universitas Karpan Bangsa. Webinar yang diadakan di, yang diadakan di Universitas Karpan Bangsa pasti akan ada quiz di akhir acaranya. Pasti dan pastikan kalian mengikuti webinar Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Ya, sebelum kuis dimulai, saya akan menyampaikan sedikit informasi tentang pendaftaran atau penerimaan mahasiswa baru saat ini Universitas Harapan Bangsa membuka gelombang empat penerimaan atau pendaftaran mahasiswa baru. Ya, dengan berbagai kesempatan yang didapatkan di gelombang empat ini seperti bebas tes masuk tulis dan juga potongan biaya kuliah hingga dua setengah juta rupiah dan bebas pilih prodi yang kamu mau mau dari jurusan apapun mau dari jurusan IPA IPS bahasa bahkan sekolah-sekolah kejuruan itu bisa memilih prodi apapun yang ada di Universitas Harapan Bangsa jangan sampai terlambat gelombang empat pendaftaran masuk baru Universitas Harapan Bangsa hingga bulan September ya jadi kalau ada saudara tetangga atau siapapun yang ingin kuliah, jangan lupa menginfokan Universitas Harapan Bangsa sebagai pilihan atau langkah awal masa depan. Ya, dan juga kita membuka kelas paralel. Ya, kelas paralel di Universitas Harapan Bangsa dibuka. Mungkin yang sibuk kerja, pengen kuliah, itu bisa sekali di Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Kita membuka kelas paralel di Fakultas Ilmu Sosial dan juga Fakultas Sains dan Teknik. 
sebagai informasi Universitas Harapan Bangsa membuka tiga fakultas yaitu ada Fakultas Ilmu Kesehatan, Fakultas Ilmu Sosial dan juga Fakultas Sains dan Teknologi. Ya, quiz time. Untuk syarat-syarat quiz atau ketentuannya saya akan bacakan terlebih dahulu. Oke, okay, next. Ya, syarat ketentuan dan juga cara menjawab ya. Follow akun Instagram Universitas Harapan Bangsa dan juga subscribe YouTube channel Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Yang nomor dua, ketik jawaban pada kolom komentar postingan flyer webinar ini dengan format nama, spasi, asal instansi atau institusi, spasi wilayah dan juga jawaban kamu. Ya, yang ketiga adalah jawaban ditunggu hingga hari ini sampai dengan tengah malam nanti atau jam. 2359. Jadi hanya hari ini saja follow ya, enggak usah lama-lama follow akun Instagram Universitas Harapan Bangsa dan juga subscribe akun YouTube channel Universitas Harapan Bangsa akan ada hadiah pulsa ratusan ribu rupiah untuk pemenangnya. Oke, next lagi. Ya, pengumuman penang akan diumumkan melalui postingan di akun Instagram Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Jadi selalu pantau, follow, dan ikuti akun Instagram Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Untuk ketuanya, jangan lupa follow juga atau subscribe akun YouTube channel Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Hadiah pulsa sebesar Rp500.000 untuk 10 orang pemenang. Wah, lumayan banget nih. Cuma nonton webinar, habis itu dapat pulsa ya. Untuk pertanyaannya, nggak pakai lama, nggak pakai ribet, langsung aja. Next pertanyaannya, yang pertanya, yang pertama, sebutkan asal istus, institusi dua pembicara luar negeri. Kita ada pembicara luar negeri tadi ya, ada dua. Sebutkan asal institusi dari dua pembicara luar negeri tadi sebagai bocoran tadi mana dari Vietnam dan juga Filipina. Ya, yang nomor dua. Sebutkan satu program studi yang ada di Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Ya, satu, kita punya tiga fakultas, yaitu Fakultas Ilmu Kesehatan, Fakultas Ilmu Sosial, dan juga Fakultas Sains dan Teknologi. Ya, sebutkan satu saja program studi yang ada di Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Serta yang terakhir ya, tuliskan pendapat kamu tentang webinar ini dengan satu kata, bebas apapun ya. Jangan lupa jawaban ditunggu hingga hari ini, jam 23.59 ya. Jawab di kolom komentar flyer ini, ya, International Webinar Universitas Harapan Bangsa yang ada di Instagram Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Jangan lupa ya, saya tunggu hingga hari ini jawaban-jawaban kamu yang menarik dan juga yang paling tepat. Ya, informasi sekali lagi, jangan lupa untuk mendaftar ya, dibuka pendaftaran gelombang 4, pendaftaran mahasiswa baru Universitas Harapan Bangsa hingga bulan September dan juga kita buka kelas. Paralel, untuk kamu yang kerja dan pengen banget kuliah, sibuk banget, kita ada solusinya, yaitu kuliah di Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Untuk info lebih lanjut atau info lebih lengkapnya, cek saja akun Instagram Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Saya Aldi, pamit undur diri. Maaf maaf bila ada salah kata, wal topik wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sa Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Kuliah mudah bikin masa depanmu makin cerah. Kuliah di UHB yuk. Gelombang 4 pendaftaran mahasiswa baru Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Dapatkan beragam kesempatan untuk kamu yang mendaftar di gelombang ini seperti bebas tes tulis masuk. Potongan biaya kuliah Rp2.500.000. Bebas pilih prodi yang kamu mau. Buruan daftar sekarang juga. Serta beberapa program unggulan Universitas Harapan Bangsa seperti magang ke Jepang khusus untuk prodi keperawatan dan kebidanan, pertukaran mahasiswa ke Korea Selatan, pertukaran mahasiswa ke Thailand. Kuliah di UHB yuk, daftar mudah dan bisa dari rumah. Klik aja pmb.uhb.ac.id, info lebih jelasnya hubungi nomor berikut ya. Well, uh, thank you very much to Mr. Aldi for such an interesting quiz and such useful information related to Harapan Bangsa University. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to remind you to not forget to follow the quiz by answering the question in the comment column on UHB Instagram. 
We will be waiting for your participation in this quiz by tonight before 12 p.m. So everybody, don't miss it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the second QAM sessions. We have got many questions from the participants, but unfortunately, we have to take only several questions. These questions are addressed to Mr. Ali, Ms. Ani, and Mr. Akhyar. Mr. Ali. Hi, Mr. Ali, are you still with us? Hi, Mr. Hello. Ali. Hello, Mr. Benny. With us? Yeah, here. All right. You've got the questions from the participant. Yes, please. All right. Can you hear me? Sure. Good. Well, uh, the question is about your applications. Uh, which one do you suggest? Uh, is it the free uh, application or the paid one? The free version or the paid one? Which one do you suggest? Okay, well, a very good question. Um, actually, there are several types of membership, yeah. They are free and then um, starter, pro, and the last one is enterprise. And each of them has benefits and weaknesses. I think for free membership, you will not be charged at all, of course. Um, but unfortunately, you only have um, five limited download on the for the lifetime. And there will be a watermark in your video and it's not comfortable. Meanwhile, for um, starter and pro, you may create your download video for about six until 10 videos per month. And of course, without watermark in uh, your video with the quality of full high definition video. But you should pay for, um, for about, uh, you can see the website, if I'm not mistaken, it's about uh, 900, uh, sorry, $19, I think. And for the pro membership, it's about $40. Uh, it's quite expensive. Meanwhile, for the enterprise member, it could be higher, yeah. And there is no limitation in creating and downloading the video. Uh, the other limitation, if you use the free version, or you have a limited in some feature, such as GIF, image, and uh, the video, and then uh, limited in micro voice, and then you can also uh, create your own template. Yeah. Um, my suggestion, if you are new in making the animation instruction, uh, first just try the what is it the free one and then uh, if you think it uh, you need more features to edit your video you can use uh, the starter membership I think um, but if you um, ask me about my suggestion for me uh, free membership is enough yeah um, to make the animated video it's already has uh, what is it it's already quite high definition video yeah, uh, for about 720 pixels. And then, but sometimes I'm not comfortable, yeah, with the watermark, um, but I can handle it, yeah. Sometimes I remove the watermark using the third party application like a video editor. Uh, you can download the video and remove the watermark and your, your problem is done. Uh, that's my but it's up to you yeah you want the free or the starter one thank you mr Vini. you're welcome thank you very much mr ali to answer the question hope that really answers the question from the participant well the next question is addressed to miss ani miss ani are you still with us of course i'm here hi miss ani all right uh you've got the question uh, the question is how to avoid students cheating during the evaluation. Oh, okay. About cheating. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Benny. Right. This is an interesting question because I think cheating is habit, right? Once we successfully cheated, 
then we will be addicted to do it again and again. So uh, we need a process to put in their mind that cheating is not good for them because in the real life, they cannot keep on anyone else. They have to survive by using their own ability. So we as the teacher or lecturers, uh, what we can do is to minimize the chance to cheat. And one of the way is by providing more questions in the question bank, then set the quiz to be suffered and also randomized. So the student will get different question. Uh, the question uh, from one student and the other will be different. And next, we can also adjust the duration of the test with the number of questions. So the student don't have any time to open the other tab or to read the learning materials or even to ask to your to their friends. Okay. And the last is set the test for one attempt only. So the students cannot repeat the attempt. By this way, the student really need to study to prepare themselves before they take the attempt to do the evaluation. Okay, Mr. Benny, I think that's all the tips that I can give to avoid cheating during the online evaluation. Yeah, okay, CBT test. Okay. Yes, thank you, Ms. Ani. Uh, yeah, it can be applied in my class as well, later on, to avoid cheating. Well, uh, the next question goes to Mr. Rakyat. Mr. Rakyat, are you still with us, Mr. Rakyat? Yeah, yeah. All right, Mr. Akhir, uh, there is a question from the participant. The question is, what is the hardest thing the lecturer have, has faced during 100% online learning, especially in learning management system, and how to handle that problem? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I don't think that we have a lot of problems uh, in handling our uh, full online because we have previously implemented this for years. So principally, we just uh, put bigger portions on the full online class that, you know, um, things like that. But maybe uh, because if you realize um, in the past two months, our government, um, I don't know, it's not frequent, but sometimes they shut down the electricity so if the power was off so it could be a challenge so we, we as a university as an institution we have to provide uh, a huge generator which means that it will be an ed additional cost so uh, that's the thing even jakarta experienced a blackout for some days so it will be a problem another challenge i think is more on the students but uh, you know, students who stay in remote areas, they try to 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 stay connected with with the our online systems. But then we 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 try to accommodate with win-win solution. Like for example, for two credit subject, the students can access one week for the course. So we put a duration, yeah, from let's say Monday until Sunday. So then the students can access. Uh, Oh, what is that the, the the material yeah for one week so we give that, that 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 kind of platform or for example if if the students really really have problems with the with the assignments for example so they have to tell personally to the to, to the lecturers so what's what's the, the problem so i think uh, uh the good culture in our university is that uh lecture can be accessed 20 uh, four hours a day. So if they have issues, so they can talk to the lecturer. So we try to find the win-win solution for, for both uh, of the parties. The thing is like this, talking about challenges and difficulties, um, uh, as, as a teacher, as a lecturer, we, we should be able to motivate our students. Sometimes students just need motivation. Students just need somebody to share uh, their stories. It's not that they are, they are in trouble, they're in difficulties. I'm confident that um, challenges and difficulties must be faced by students from periods of times, different period of times. Students in, in uh, who studied our uh, our fathers, for example, who studied in 70s and 80s, they didn't have internet. So that's the challenge. They have to access the book by themselves directly. 
those who studied in 90s like me, we didn't have, we just had a computer. Everything must be uh, through uh, WS, for example. You know, we didn't have that kind of advanced technology. So even, uh, you know, I, I could still record, uh, recall my, my, my study period when I had to write a letter to a friend to ask a question. Then they had to send it back. So that's the art of challenges from time to time. When I study overseas as well, it's not that easy. We had to we had to face a tough professors, for example. We have we, we have a lot of deadlines. We have a bunch of works to do. That's also a challenge. So I try to motivate and entertain my students that actually this is your time. This is the challenge that you're facing. Our challenge in the past was different from you. Actually, let's uh, let's struggle together instead of complaining the government or complaining the system or blaming the pandemic. So let's us you know go together. You know instead of looking for alternatives or finding other aims or objectives, let us find ways to achieve our dreams with an innovative ways. Don't change your dreams. Just change the path of the ways. I think it will be great. Uh, another thing that I tell my students, but maybe because this is in the university level, is that uh, because I, I, I give my students these quotes, it's from Socrates, yeah? So, and it, it's also uh, cultivated in our institution. What is the responsibility of uh, the students? So, as a teacher, we, we have to ensure that the students are given a full responsibility, yeah? A full responsibility, and they have to be responsible to what they thought, to what they feel, and to what they do. But it must be supported by strong references. That's the thing that, uh, that, that I have to highlight when we talk about adult learnings. So what you're doing is actually your responsibility. You can do anything you want. You can do anything. You can think whatever you want to think, but it has to be with responsibilities. So that's the thing. Thank you so much. I All hope right. it Very answers great. the question. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Akhyar. It's really enlightening and empowering answers. <laughs> right. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, all materials have been successfully delivered by all great presenters. The conclusion of today's webinar is that adopting a blended learning approach offers the appeal of combining different learning elements using the power of ICT while retaining a human touch. It can be concluded that synchronous communication, for example, using live Zoom, Google Meet, and etc. environments should coexist with asynchronous ones, for example, Moodle, email, blog, Blackboard, and etc. Last but not least, this online learning teaches both the teachers and the students on how to be autonomous and motivated human beings. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express my gratitude to all presenters, Mr. Huang, Ms. Gina, Mr. Akhyar, Ms. Ani, and Mr. Ali, who have shared their knowledge to all of us. Hopefully, it can increase our insight as well as horizon, specifically in English education. Let's give a big round of applause for all the great presenters, or you can give a clap clap in the Zoom chat. Thank you, great presenters. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you. Before this webinar ends, I want to remind you to fill in the feedback form, which has been shared by the committee in the Telegram group or in the Zoom or YouTube chat. Well, all these things, with, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this webinar. We would like to thank you for participating and sparing your time to join this webinar. I, as the MC, as well as the moderator of today's webinar, and as the representative of the committee, would like to ask for your apology if there are some inconvenient words and attitude during this webinar. Let's end today's webinar by saying Alhamdulillah together. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. As an additional information, Universitas Harapan Bangsa will hold some other interesting and useful webinar in the near future. I hope you can still be with us in the Telegram channel for further information about our upcoming webinars. Thank you, everybody. 
Hope you can get many benefits from this webinar. See you next time and stay safe and healthy. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Study hard, students. Lampung the treasures of Sumatra is a province that becomes the gateway to the Sumatra island. Lampung has two municipalities and 13 districts, consisting of 234 sub-districts. The province with an area of 35,587 km squares owns millions of extraordinary natural beauty. Education in Lampung province is also highly considered and colored by the existence of Universitas Teknokrat Indonesia. Universitas Teknokrat Indonesia has three faculties and 12 study programs. Faculty of Engineering and Computer Sciences with the six study programs. Electrical Engineering, Civil Engineering, Computer Engineering, Information Technology, Informatics, and Information System. Faculty of Economics and Business with two study programs, Management and Accounting. Faculty of Arts and Education with four study programs English Literature, Mathematics Education, English Education, and Physical Education. Universitas Technocrat Indonesia believes that education is the key to the advancement of a nation. Universitas Technocrat Indonesia commits to produce and develop future leaders through the education of quality characters. This receives a very good reception and trust from the community which is marked by increasing interest in students from year to year. The students and lecturers have lots of achievements and awards. Also, our quality is recognized by National Accreditation Board for Higher Education and many international collaborations. Universitas Teknokrat Indonesia also prepares the students to face the globalization era through the use of digital technology. Universitas Teknokrat Indonesia has a number of representative facilities provided to support the learning process, such as comfortable classroom, laboratories, information technology, and the internet. Our vision is to be an excellent university in Sumatra with international standard and able to play an active role in nation building through three pillars of higher education comprising education, research, and community service. We have graduated outstanding students who can be accepted in state agencies and other large companies. At Universitas Teknokrat Indonesia, the students and lecturers are encouraged to create and innovate by creating products and services that benefit the community through research activities and community services. In an effort to achieve its visions and missions, the academics of Universitas Teknokrat Indonesia are guided by the organizational culture values of discipline, quality, creative, and innovative. To support the quality of learning processes, we have very complete and sophisticated facilities, including digital-based smart classroom, hotspot in campus area, sport facilities, auditorium, and students' hall. Come and be a part of us, the Campus of Champion, Universitas Teknokrat Indonesia. dan berkembang bersama membangun negeri telah menjadi cita-cita besar yang tertanam kuat di benak seluruh anak bangsa. Purwokerto, kota kami tercinta ini telah menjadi bagian tak terpisahkan dari sejarah panjang berdirinya negeri subur di garis katulistiwa. Indahnya alam serta luhurnya budaya Banyumas menjadi daya tarik yang eksotis bagi siapapun yang ingin mengenalnya. 
Kota ini merupakan salah satu pusat pendidikan terbesar yang terletak di bagian selatan Provinsi Jawa Tengah. Panjang sudah perjalanan kami membersamai anak-anak bangsa belajar, membangun karakter dan mengasah kompetensi. Kami tidak akan pernah lelah untuk terus berjuang dan bertransformasi dalam mewujudkan cita-cita luhur berdaulatnya negara kita tercinta, Indonesia. Selamat datang di Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Tempat kami belajar. Mengasah kemampuan. Untuk menjadi ahli. Di bidang yang kami tekuni. Universitas Harapan Bangsa atau UHB merupakan sebuah transformasi dari stikes harapan bangsa yang didirikan pada tahun 2002 di bawah naungan Yayasan Pendidikan Dwi Puspita oleh Bapak Haji Syahrudin Amin. Kami berkomitmen untuk menjalankan misi penyelenggaraan pendidikan tinggi berkualitas serta memiliki semangat kewirausahaan dalam rangka membangun SDM mandiri, profesional, dan berbudaya, menyelenggarakan penelitian, serta mengabdi kepada masyarakat. UHB telah menjalin kerjasama internasional dengan perguruan tinggi di berbagai negara, seperti Australia, Filipina, Thailand, Malaysia, dan India. UHB saat ini memiliki tiga fakultas dengan 14 bidang studi. Program pendidikan di UHB telah dirancang agar mahasiswa dapat memperoleh pemahaman dari disiplin ilmu yang diajarkan serta memiliki keterampilan praktik yang aplikatif dengan didukung penggunaan teknologi digital di setiap program studi yang ada. UHB menyediakan fasilitas yang sangat mumpuni untuk mendukung kenyamanan belajar mahasiswa, seperti perpustakaan, laboratorium komputer, Laboratorium Ilmu Kesehatan Laboratorium Ilmu Sosial Ruang belajar berbasis teknologi dengan video dan audio recorder Fasilitas beribadah Dosen profesional dari berbagai negara dan universitas besar Indonesia Dan kesempatan luas untuk mendapatkan beasiswa, pertukaran pelajar, serta magang ke berbagai negara di seluruh dunia UHB mendukung penuh pengembangan minat dan bakat mahasiswa melalui berbagai unit kegiatan mahasiswa seperti olahraga, seni, Hai, nama aku Sela, nama aku Esa. Aku mahasiswa tingkat akhir di Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Aku berasal dari Lampung. Aku kuliah di Universitas Harapan Bangsa. Suasana kampus di sini dari dulu aku semester 1 sampai 6 selalu kondusif ya, selalu asik. Kuliah sangat nyaman banget karena dosennya yang asik, metode pembelajaran menarik. Buat mahasiswa tingkat akhir kayak aku pastinya rajin banget yang namanya ke perpustakaan. Tapi aku betah lama-lama di sana berjam-jam sekalipun karena aku ngerasain nyamannya fasilitas di perpustakaan itu, wah itu nggak berasa di perpus ya, dan fasilitas yang sangat oke okay banget. Kami dari Yayasan akan berupaya semaksimal mungkin memberikan dukungan secara penuh kepada Universitas Harapan Bangsa dalam penyediaan sarana, prasarana, sumber daya manusia, baik staff maupun dosen, 
agar Universitas Harapan Bangsa dapat mewujudkan visi misinya dengan baik. Universitas Harapan Bangsa siap mewujudkan cita-cita besar untuk menjadi Center of Excellence Perguruan Tinggi dalam pengembangan IPTEX dan sumber daya manusia yang mandiri dan berbudaya. Kami terus berupaya mengantarkan anak bangsa untuk menjadi lulusan yang profesional dan memiliki semangat kewirausahaan serta mampu bersaing secara global. UHB siap mencetak lulusan unggul dan berkarakter yang didukung dengan kemampuan bahasa Inggris serta jiwa kewirausahaan. Sehingga siap ditempatkan di berbagai posisi strategis baik dalam bidang pekerjaan maupun wirausaha. Bersama UHB, kita songsong masa depan bangsa yang cemerlang.